In the live broadcast of the interview with the four heavenly monarchs from the demon meeting hall, one of the interviewees said that even though one of his comrades is one of the four heavenly monarchs, he is the weakest. The main character, standing nearby in a cloak with a hood thrown over his head, looked in bewilderment at the one who had recently spoken, and realized that on that day he became known as the weakest. However, for some reason, he, the weakest of the four heavenly monarchs, became the master of heroes and saints. He remembered that he and the heavenly emperors had been childhood friends since the days when they were neighbors and always got together. The main character thought that if they were assigned to the same army division, then they would receive the highest ranks as quickly as possible, and they became the four heavenly monks and were always together. Recalling all the times they spent time together, he noted that they were connected by fate. At the moment, the main character looked at his other comrades, who were sitting on high thrones and looking at him. Among them were Vognis, who had the skill of stunning Tsunami, Brazel, who was a fierce flame, Ruviana, who had a dazzling fog. The main character, whose name was Capsidy, who had the deadly scorpion skill, looked at the other monarchs in disbelief and asked if he had really been dismissed from the four heavenly monarchs. He asked why this is so. Brazel replied that this is because Capsidy is the weakest of them, and Capsidy asked again in bewilderment. He suddenly froze, eyes wide with indignation and frowning, and mentally asked them not to say that all this was because of that incident. Capsidy remembered that a month ago, when they were at a press conference, a problem arose when one of the reporters noted that they had previously said who was the strongest and asked who was the weakest. Capsidy then, standing with a displeased look, mentally noted that usually they would have hit the reporter for such a question. He thought that from the very beginning, the four of them did everything together, and no one could be called either the strongest or the weakest. Capsidy, grinning, looked at Brazel, who was standing not far from him, and mentally asked if this was so. He suddenly saw Brazel and Vognes pointing their fingers at him, and his eyes widened in surprise. Brazel said, although Capsidy is one of the four heavenly monarchs, he is the weakest, and Vognes admitted that he also thinks so. Ruviana exclaimed that she did not agree, and Capsidy remembered that this created a fuss among the demons, and because of this, rumors began to spread about him that he was actually the weakest. At the moment, Capsidy sighed and said with a smile that it was just a performance, and Brazel asked how did such a weakling like Capsidy get into the four heavenly monarchs. He noted that if they were considered weak, it would affect the reputation of the demon king's army, and Capsidy displeasedly asked what kind of nonsense he was talking about. He exclaimed indignantly that it all started because of Brazel, but Brazel, raising his hand up, caused an explosion, seriously saying that Capsodius's resignation had already been decided, so he should pack his things and leave. Brazel left, and Vognis noted that while they had all reached level 1 a long time ago, Capsodius was still at the same level, so he would be glad to get rid of him. Ruviana ran up to Capsidy and, calling out to Vognis, said that this was because of one of Capsidy's attributes, but Capsidy interrupted her words, saying that she shouldn't do that. He admitted that what he did couldn't just be ignored, but noted that he was really just a first-level athlete. Capsidy thought that he couldn't create shiny things like Brazel's explosion, and as a result, he couldn't impress the Demon King, so he would never get his own territory. Ruviana, clenching her hands into fists, quietly asked why Capsidy is such a simpleton. He turned to her and asked if she really said something. Ruviana said that she had not said anything, and calling Capsodius, shouted at him to just leave here. Capsidy noted that this was cruel, and grabbing Ruvian's hands and pressing her to the wall, said that even the heroine found a few kind words for him on such a day. Ruviana angrily told him to just shut his mouth and get out of here, but when Capsidy simply agreed with this, she calmed down, looking at him in bewilderment. She suddenly sadly let go of her head, asking for forgiveness, and admitted that she could do nothing for him. Capsidy was surprised, but patting Ruvian on the head, he smiled and thanked her. Tears appeared in Ruvian's eyes, and Capsidy thought that in this way he, the deadly scorpion, left the city of the Demon King. A little later, walking down the street, he thought that if he returned to his native village, then all that awaited him would be just work in the field, and besides, he did not know what they would think about someone like him who was fired from the capital. Capsidy imagined how other demons would look at him contemptuously and, laughing, call him the weakest, but displeasedly ordered himself to stop thinking like that, deciding that, in any case, that night he would be able to rest with Cerberus. He remembered his cute three-headed dog, and, entering the house, announced that he had returned. 
However, Capsidy froze on the threshold, seeing that his entire house was on fire, and falling to his knees, screamed in despair, asking what it was. A huge demon, more like a reptile, suddenly appeared next to him, who noted that Capsidy was still alive. He said that, according to rumors, Capsidy is the weakest of the four heavenly monarchs, and released fire from his mouth. Capsidy, still sitting on his knees, asked if he burned it at home. The man shouted for Capsidy to answer his question first, but without waiting for Capsidy's words, he decided that it didn't matter and explained that he was one of Brazel's subordinates, whose name was Bastin. Bastin said that he possesses flaming destruction, but Capsidy, not paying attention to this, said that he did not care and ordered to answer. He asked again seriously, did Bastin burn down his house? Fable asked him to relax and asked how a person with such a bad character as Capsodius got into the four heavenly monarchs. He eventually admitted that it was him and explained that it was Brazel's orders. A flame appeared next to Bastin's mouth again, and he asked Capsidy to wait, because this was not all. He announced that when he killed Capsodius, Brazel would appoint him one of the four heavenly monarchs, and Capsidy, rising to his feet, said that everything was clear to him. He seriously said that in this case Bastin should try it and die. Capsidy created a glowing magic circle, directing it at Bastin, but when Capsodium's spell dissipated, nothing happened and Bastin, after giving Capsodium a puzzled look, grinned and laughed, shouting that Capsidy should plan his threats better. He admitted that he didn't even know that stupid mistakes were required to become a heavenly monarch. Bastin asked what Capsidy actually meant by his words try and die. He said that of the two of them, it would be Capsidy who would die. But suddenly his body began to deform, and Bastin, falling to his knees, asked what it was. Wheezing and stuttering, he noted that Capsidy should have been the weakest, and Capsidy, looking indifferently at the fallen Bastin, realized that he did not know that each of the four monarchs had their own element. He explained that Brazel's attribute is fire, Vogni's is water, Ruviana is wind, and his attribute is death. Capsidy suddenly noticed with surprise that Bastin could no longer hear him, and sighing, asked what only Brazel teaches his subordinates. He sadly noted that he took this place from the Demon King, and now he no longer has a job, a home, or a loyal dog, and he is becoming poorer and poorer. And suddenly Capsidy heard someone bark behind him, and, turning around, happily shouted the name Cerberus. The three-headed dog wagged his tail with joy, and Capsidy, running up to it, hugged Cerberus and exclaimed that he was very glad that it had been saved. He assumed that Cerberus had escaped before the house was burned, and exclaimed that this was a good feeling. Continuing to hug his pet, Capsidy asked him to listen carefully and explained that he was no longer one of the four heavenly monarchs. He assumed that he would now be pursued, and when they got to him, he had no right to put Cerberus in danger. Cerberus barked pitifully, and Capsidy, closing his eyes, offered it a choice. Will it be with him despite the danger, or will he live with Ravian in the only safe place he knows? Thinking about Ruvian, Capsidy noted that he could trust her, and wanted to say what would happen no matter what Cerberus chose, but did not have time to finish the sentence as the dog turned around and ran towards Ruvian's house, barking. Capsidy, extending his hand after Cerberus, silently looked at the retreating dog for a while, and then, smiling, wished him a good journey. A little later, sitting on the ground in the forest, Capsidy thought that he was not sure why, but all this time he was walking towards the territory of people. He noted that this was the power of loneliness and asked what he should do now. Capsidy did not know if he could hide among people all the time, and remembered that his ancestors, starting from the tenth generation, were similar to people, and he became half lick, half man and half dead, and now, when he is being pursued in human territory he can be safer. In the end, clenching his hands into fists, Capsidy decided that he would go into human territory. He didn't have time to continue thinking about what I would do next, because suddenly a huge man landed next to him, noting that another small rat had come here. Capsidy, turning to the man who appeared, said displeasedly that today was simply not his day. The man, throwing his huge sword over his shoulder, asked if Capsidy was also from the heroine's company. Capsidy looked at the man in bewilderment, and he said that he had already encountered the heroine, and asked Capsidy to just listen to what he had to say. He advised that Capsidy should just give up if he was there to defeat him, since he was invincible. He asked if Capsidy knew why this was. The man explained that this was because he had eight lives, and Capsidy, noticing the glowing spots on the man's chest, realized that his soul could store human souls, suggesting that it was a soul of many deaths spell. 
Capsidy noted that this is a spell of the element of death, which allows you to take away human souls, and the process is felt the same way as it is called, namely, it hurts as if the person is dying. The man at that moment noted that Capsidy was really a non-entity, and Capsidy asked who he even was. The man asked if he really didn't know him. He laughed and noted that this was excellent, but preparing to attack, added that now that Capsidy knew his secret, he could not let him escape alive. Capsidy thought that he really was not shutting up, and the man, grinning, asked Capsidy to bring him a souvenir from hell, and saying his name, announced that he was a mad death and most of all loved young girls with silver hair. Capsidy asked himself in bewilderment, how should he react to Vazag's words? Vazag, brandishing his weapon, asked if Capsidy would accept death at his hand. Capsidy extended his own hand forward and indifferently said that Vazag should try this and die. Vazag found himself surrounded by light and, dying, said that this was impossible because Capsidy had destroyed all eight souls. Vazag did not understand how this was possible, and Capsidy, holding his head with his hand and sighing, asked what he meant. He explained that even if a person has many lives, an instant kill is still an instant kill. Capsidy looked at the huge sword that fell next to Vazag's body, and, turning his gaze to the glowing balls rising into the air, wished it to rest in peace. He leaned over to the bag, which also fell next to Vazag's body, and noted that it contained some money and medicine. Capsidy did not know how valuable human money was, but decided that now he had nothing at all, and, continuing to look around, asked what else was interesting here. He looked at the Vazag sword again, and, picking it up, began to stuff the sword into the traveler's magical bag, gritting his teeth with tension, since the weapon turned out to be very heavy. Capsidy noted that such weapons could not be used for attacks, and suggested that Vazag lived somewhere nearby. He imagined with horror what had happened to the heroine, and suddenly he smelled another corpse, suggesting that Vazag lived nearby. Capsidy realized that he had no choice, and, taking out the death note, looked at the shining pages, remembering that all the information about the dead was written inside the death note. Running his finger along the lines with written names, Capsidy found the name and, after reading the necessary information, noted that, as he thought, Vazag lives nearby, which means there must be something else here. Soon Capsidy came to a huge cave and, going inside, saw a girl chained to a stone wall. He noted that there was someone inside, and looking closer at the girl, he realized that there was a silver-haired young girl. Capsidy called Vazag a pervert and realized that he kept prisoners here. The girl, noticing Capsidy, looked at him in fear, but Capsidy, extending his hand in her direction, asked the girl not to be afraid, saying that he was not an enemy. He asked if the girl was here because of the heroine. He assumed that she was accompanying the heroine or something like that, and the girl, hearing about the heroine, began to cry, saying that a terrible thing happened to her while she was saving her. Capsidy, squatting next to the sobbing girl, looked to the side, seeing nearby the heroine's corpse lying in pools of blood. He noted that she looked like a human beast, and judging by her ears and tail, she was from the Crimson Wolf family. Coming closer to the corpse, Capsidy touched it and noted that the heroine was still warm. He asked what her name was. The girl first asked again in surprise, and then said that it was by Pathomia Primal. The girl asked in bewilderment what Capsidy was doing. Capsidy, without answering her question, took out the death note and, having found the name Primal, read that one hour ago she was defeated with one blow from a dragon tooth sword. Taking out a brush and twirling it in her fingers several times, Capsidy wrote in her notebook that a little later Primal began to breathe again, and a shining magic circle appeared on the ground under the heroine. Capsidy simply watched what was happening, and the girl chained to the wall behind him opened her eyes wide in surprise. Pephimia suddenly inhaled and coughed. Yura noted that she had come to life and thought that this was a great relief, and the girl, looking at Capsidy with tears in her eyes, asked herself, how is this possible? She assumed that it was a spell to revive the dead and thought that even a high-level priest could not use such a skill if he gathered a hundred people, because it was impossible to do this without an altar and relics. She looked at Capsodius closing the death note and asked who this man was. The girl, continuing to look in bewilderment at the revived Pephimia, asked if she had really returned to life. She asked herself again, who is this person? Calling Capsodius, she asked how he used resurrection magic without sacred relics and other things. Capsidy remembered that until then, in human territory, resurrection magic was prohibited for reasons of ethics and other nonsense. 
He thought that he used to bring back a thousand demons a day from the other world, because the demon people had a bad birth rate, so he was tasked with reviving fallen warriors every day. Capsidy remembered how, while adding the necessary lines to the death note, he angrily thought that resurrection was very annoying to him, and noted that he worked over and over again, never having the opportunity to take part in the battle, which is why he has no combat experience, and he himself he has an eternal first level. As a result, he was removed and Capsidy, distracted from his own thoughts, smiled and noted that the girl was lucky that Pophimius' body did not begin to decompose, admitting that he was glad that he made it in time. The girl burst into tears of happiness and, calling Capsodius a saint, thanked him for this. Capsidy looked at the girl in bewilderment, realizing that he was being thanked for someone's resurrection. He sent the heavenly monks to hell, but thought that he was not a saint, but a demon and was one of the four heavenly monarchs. And suddenly Pophimia, waving her tail, grabbed the wound on her stomach with her hand and screamed that she was in great pain. Capsidy, turning to Pathimius, realized that he had forgotten that he could not carry out a complete restoration. The girl, calling out to Pathimius, asked Capsidy to free her from the chains. Capsidy did this, and the girl, approaching Pathimius, turned to the gentle winds blowing here and said that she was looking for a blessing in the breath of the sources. The girl's hands glowed, and Capsidy realized with surprise that this was the breath of a god, which only high-ranking priests could use. He realized who this girl was, and at that moment Pophimia, whose wound had been healed, jumped on Sharon, hugging her, and thanked her for saving her. Bursting into tears, Pophimia asked Sharon for forgiveness for dragging her into this terrible nightmare, and admitted that she realized that she was too weak. Sharon, also crying, said that she knew this, but noted that the main thing was that they were alive, and this was only a test sent to them by God. She suddenly added that it was better for Pophimia to direct her gratitude to Capsodius, because he was the one who brought her back to life. Sharon apologized for not knowing Capsidy's name, and, saying that her name was Sharon the Strong, explained that she was a servant of God. Pophimia said that her name was Pophimia Primal, and exclaimed that, as Capsidy had probably already guessed, she was one of the Crimson Wolves, originally from the Southern Mountains. She added that Sharon is simply incredible, recalling that people call her the Prophet of the Holy Virgin. Capsidy mentally questioned in horror, asking himself, isn't this the most famous priestess even in the land of demons? He remembered that because of Sharon's very accurate predictions, the army of the Lord of Darkness suffered many defeats. He noted that Sharon was very young, and looking at Pathemius, noted with displeasure that she had chosen this ball of fur as a hero. Pophimia, coming closer to Capsodius, enthusiastically asked what his name was. Capsidy began to say this, but suddenly he coughed and blood began to flow from his mouth, and Capsidy realized that he had almost told them his real name. Smiling, he said that his name was Capua and added that he was pleased to meet you. Sharon and Pophimia exclaimed that they were glad to meet each other, and Capsidy noted that he could not even think that he would encounter the holy prophet and heroine at the very beginning of his new life, because he is a demon, so this combination is very bad. In the end, Capsidy decided that he would simply ask them to accompany him to the city, and then they would go their separate ways. Sharon suddenly said that they should leave this place as soon as possible, and Pophimia agreed with this, noting that Vazag could return soon, and then it would be bad. Capsidy asked them to wait and explained that this was not necessary. He took out a dragonfang blade from his bag, showing it to Pephimia and Sharon, and they looked at the sword in surprise. Capsidy explained that he killed Vazag, and Pephimia, repeating, noted that Vazag was level 110. She suggested that Capsidy is very strong, and Sharon asked what level is Capsidy. Capsidy said that he was level 1, and Pephimia patted him on the back and exclaimed that he was a joker. Sharon, taking Capsidy's hand, used the assessment skill and noted with horror that he really had the first level. Capsidy asked himself why she turned so pale. Pathemia and Sharon did not understand how Capsidy defeated Vazag then, and Sharon asked that Capsidy not say that he was such an incredible master of strategy, filled with the experience of many battles. Capsidy looked at them in bewilderment, and Sharon exclaimed that there was no other explanation she could think of because he definitely used some kind of tactic to defeat that scoundrel. Capsidy thought that everything was wrong and asked if he had a lot of experience, then why did he only have the first level? However, Sharon and Pephimia did not notice his condition, shouting enthusiastically that it was cool. Pephimia suddenly sighed and turned to Capsidy. 
He said displeasedly that he didn't like where this was going, and Pafimia, hugging Capsodius by the neck, asked him to take her as his student. Sharon laughed happily, and Capsidy thought that his new life in human territory began with the worst possible encounter with the heroine and holy priestess. A little later in the border town of Nouvelle, children ran through the streets, playing, and adults, laughing and smiling, talked. Capsidy, looking at this, thought that this was the ideal city for his new life. Sharon walked next to Capsidy, and Pafinia, hugging him, practically hung on Capsidy. Capsidy awkwardly thought that he needed to do something with them, and Pafimia at that moment again asked him to take her on as a student. Capsodia repeated that he had already said that he himself was still studying, and therefore could not take on students. He suddenly stopped and, smiling, announced that their paths diverged here. He thanked Pafimia and Sharon for taking him all the way to the city, and Pafimia, waving her tail and arms, began shouting that she did not want this. Sharon, coming closer to Capsidy, suggested that he planned to look for work in the city. Capsidy didn't answer, but thought it was part of his plan, and Sharon asked why don't they go to the guild together. Capsidy asked in confusion, and Sharon explained that this was a place to offer and receive work, adding that the two of them needed to register as adventurers. Capsidy asked her to wait and asked if they really wanted to kill the demon lord. Pofimia hugged Capsodius again, and Sharon said that they planned to do this, but everything changed because of Pafimius. Pafimia sadly admitted that in the battle against Vezag, she realized that she lacked combat experience, so if she attacked the army of the Demon Lord, she was unlikely to be able to defeat the strong demons. Capsidy, looking at Pafimius, thought that she was right, but mentally added that, from his point of view, Pafimius' potential completely goes beyond logic, however, one way or another, she is severely lacking in practice. Sharon at this point explained that because of this, they decided that Pafimia needed to gain experience by completing monster-slaying missions and collecting pieces of it as proof of the work done. Sharon admitted that they believe that Pafimia will be able to gain experience by working as an adventurer. Pafimia exclaimed that Sharon was mistaken because the best option was to become a student, but Capsidy did not let her finish, and, covering Pafimia's mouth with his hand, he realized that they were offering to travel together while they worked for the guild. He removed his hand from Pafimius's face and agreed, adding that he would do this as long as they were in the guild. Pafimia jumped up, hugging Capsodius's neck with her arms, and joyfully exclaimed that they would be together with him again. Capsidy, frowning in disgust, turned away, thinking that Pafimia was very close. Sharon turned around and offered to go, since they had decided everything, and remembered that the guild should be somewhere nearby. Pofimia happily exclaimed that this was really fun, and Sharon and Capsidy commented that she was very loud. They soon arrived at the guild and, upon entering, saw the reception desk, as well as other adventurers who were relaxing, sitting on barrels at long tables, or selecting a task by looking at a special board. The guild secretary, smiling welcomingly, said welcome to them, and Capsidy, looking around, realized that this was a guild. Even though Capsidy had carried out reconnaissance missions into human territory, this was his first time here. Approaching the reception desk, Capsidy admitted that he was now looking for a job, and Pafimia, hearing this, asked in bewilderment if he wasn't an adventurer too. Capsidy confirmed this, remembering that he had killed countless people so far, but right now he wants to end this bloody lifestyle and just work where nothing dictates to him. The secretary, taking a blank sheet of paper and a pen for writing, asked Capsidy to say his name. Capsidy began to say his real name, but stopped, saying that it was not his name. He said his name was Capua, and added that he had no last name. The secretary wrote down his name, and asked if Capsidy would mind if she asked him about his academic performance. Capsidy asked again in bewilderment, and the secretary, adding that she still needed to find out about his qualifications, asked which trade unions he was currently a member of. She said if Capsodius had letters of recommendation, then he could pass them on, and seeing the awkward smile on Capsodius's face and his confused look, she assumed that he did not have it on him. After apologizing, the secretary said if that was the case, then from the point of view of the work she could give him, everything was not so good. Capsidy trembled, fearfully asking if there really was no work for him. The secretary replied that it was impossible to say that there was no work at all, and asked how about this. She took out several sheets of paper with a picture of a cat on it, as well as several cans of cat food, and explained that Capsidy could be offered a job as a cat feeder. Capsidy repeated the title of this work and asked how much he would be paid for it. 
The secretary replied that the profit from the cats was greater than Capsidy thought, and Capsidy, mentally thanking her, thought that this was exactly what he wanted to hear. Suddenly, Capsidy heard him being asked not to worry, because everything will be fine, since even if he has nothing, he can always become an adventurer by passing a simple test, and if he can increase his rank, life in the mansion will become quite achievable purpose. Capsidy turned around to see Sharon and Paphemius smiling happily, and grimaced as he placed his hands on the counter in front of him and agreed to become an adventurer. Paphimia and Sharon were very happy about this, and Paphimia, hugging Capsodius, joyfully exclaimed that now they could travel together. Capsidy displeasedly asked Paphimia not to approach him in front of other people, and at that moment the secretary, taking out a ball lying on a special soft substrate, said that if we talk about the test, they are going to check if they have the qualities to become an adventurer. Placing the ball on the table, the secretary explained that there was no need to focus on this, and all you need to do is just touch the magical device. Capsidy, looking at the ball, realized what the test was and thought that this was bad, because if his magic was assessed as high-rank magic, then he could be kicked out as a demon. At that moment, Paphimia, raising her hand up, exclaimed that she would be the first to pass this test. Capsidy thought that was well said, noting that he could now see for himself the level of technology of this device. Paphimius was asked if she really also wanted to become an adventurer. Paphimia confirmed this and extended her hand to the ball. The device suddenly began to glow, and the adventurers who came closer noted that it was a very noble color, very similar to white. They had never seen anything like it, and those who knew about the device's operation explained that they would make a decision based on what the magical device said about Paphimia's capabilities. Everyone was waiting for the result of Paphimia, and when the light dissipated, a mist appeared around the ball, and it asked, What is Paphimia? The secretary said that this was surprising, and when Paphimia asked again in bewilderment, she enthusiastically explained that the people about whom the magical device spoke so much later became heroes and accomplished many great feats. That is, in other words, this is the best result. The adventurers who heard this were also very happy, deciding that they would drink non-stop for several days to celebrate. Paphimia asked if the secretary was saying this seriously. She hugged Sharon and exclaimed that this meant her prophecy had come true. The secretary repeated the words of Paphemius in shock and, looking at Sharon, asked if she was really the saint of prophecy. Sharon, along with Paphemius, stood next to Capsidy, pointed her hand at Paphemius, and explained that this girl was Paphemia Primal, and she was chosen by her to become a hero. The secretary bowed and apologized for being rude, but Sharon said that they were also to blame, and therefore apologized for hitting them all. She explained that since Paphemius still had no combat experience, they thought about having her gain it by working as an adventurer. The secretary realized what was going on, and Paphimia asked if they could already assess Capsodius' abilities. The secretary, having heard that Paphimia called Capsidy a master, asked again in bewilderment, but Capsidy, laughing awkwardly, said that Paphimia simply said about it without thinking. Turning to the magical device, Capsidy frowned and expressed hope that everything would be okay. He extended his hand to the ball, touching it, and everything around was illuminated with a bright light. The secretary asked in bewilderment, What kind of divine light is this? Paphimia, covering her eyes to protect it from the bright light, exclaimed that this was amazing, and added that this was to be expected from Capsodius. Capsidy, gritting his teeth and frowning, covered his face with his hand, turned his head, and asked himself, What is this? He noted that everything was happening differently from Paphimius, and at that moment a fog appeared around the magical device, and it said that Capsidy was just a devil. Everyone was shocked to hear this, and Capsidy asked in confusion what kind of nonsense this was. The ball started talking again and said that it was just a curse. The secretary froze in surprise, and then, running up to the magical device, she asked if this was really a new phrase. Capsidy was shocked to hear this and looked at the secretary in surprise, and all the other adventurers had the same reaction. However, after a moment of confusion, the adventurers began to shout in delight, because despite the fact that they had worked in this guild for many years, they had never heard such phrases before. They asked each other if this was even written down in the guild manual. Some people didn't believe that this was a new phrase, but everyone shouted that it was very cool. Paphimia, running up to Capsodius, hugged him and said enthusiastically that this was to be expected from him. Capsidy asked again in bewilderment, and Sharon suggested that Capsidy was a savior sent to them by God, since he was able to utter a new phrase. 
Capsidy noticed the tears of delight that appeared in Sharon's eyes and realized that even she reacted this way. Suddenly, someone said that the day had come when the history of this guild would change, and everyone turned around in surprise and noticed a huge man entering the guild. The adventurers looked at the man excitedly, and only Capsidy practically did not react to this. The adventurers realized that this was Mackenzie, who was a silver adventurer and was now the guild master. Coming closer to the guys, Mackenzie said that now he understands. He assumed that the adventurer standing in front of him was the one who caused the new phrase to appear, and after examining Pephimia, he noted that he saw that she had very beautiful proportions of her entire body, but it was explained to him that it was Pephimia who was chosen by the Saint of Prophecy. Mackenzie, looking at Sharon, assumed that she was the same adventurer, but he was told that this was the Saint of Prophecy. Mackenzie, looking enthusiastically from Sharon to Pephimius, asked who knew that the heroine and Saint of Prophecy would come here. He asked the others to look at how beautiful they were and asked if they were not sweet. Mackenzie said if someone had told him in advance, he would have cleared up a little before greeting them. And Capsidy, looking at Mackenzie's strange reaction, asked himself, what happened to this excited old man? The secretary at that moment, coming closer to Capsidy and pointing her hand at him, said that he was the adventurer with a new phrase. Mackenzie looked seriously at Capsodius, assessing him, and in the end, said that this guy was worth nothing. Capsidy looked at Mackenzie indignantly, and the guild leader meanwhile continued, saying that Capsodium's face does not give the feeling that he is strong, his eyes look lifeless, and his body looks like Capsidy will fly into the distance if Mackenzie just breathes in his direction. Capsidy thought displeasedly that his eyes would be lifeless, since he was half-lick, so it was not his fault. Mackenzie said that was not bad, and noting that he had been a guild master for about forty years, admitted that he had never heard such a phrase. He wondered, asking if this meant that Capsodius had a greater affinity than with the phrase what the, or did it mean that he had less affinity than with the phrase how unusual. He also suggested that this could mean that Capsidy is truly a cursed being, such as a member of a demon race. Capsidy looked at Mackenzie in fear, but he smiled and exclaimed that it was just a joke, as if a demon had simply come to a human city and taken the adventurer exam. He asked, laughing, what did he even say? Capsidy thought with relief that this was just a joke, and, pulling his hood further over his head to hide his face, he noted that he really wanted to quickly finish the registration and get out of here. He mentally suggested that he accidentally change the subject, and suddenly he heard a buzzing sound. Capsidy was surprised to recognize this sound, realizing that a fly was flying somewhere nearby. Mackenzie, meanwhile, said that they could find out when they fought each other, and Sharon asked in horror if Mackenzie was really going to fight Capsidy. Mackenzie asked for forgiveness, but said that as the person in charge of the guild, it was his duty to check whether Capsidy was evil or not. He suddenly looked at Capsodius, who had taken up a fighting position in an attempt to drive away the fly, and noted that his opponent also wanted to fight. Capsidy looked at Mackenzie with horror, and Pophemia, looking at him, exclaimed that this bloodthirstiness was amazing. Sharon realized what Capsidy was like when he was serious, but one adventurer added that Mackenzie was serious about it too, and another suggested that Capsidy would simply be crushed. Capsidy did not pay attention to these words and, continuing to listen to the buzzing, thought that there was no doubt that it was watching him, deciding that this would be the best opponent of his life. Finally, he noticed a fly, noting that half-liches and flies are inextricably linked with each other, because half-liches are a race of half-dead demons that always exude a slight smell of corpses, although this smell is so weak that even a human beast cannot smell it. The fly again disappeared from Capsidy's field of vision, and he, continuing to listen to the buzzing, asked where it was. He thought that a fly even had the audacity to show itself in human territory, and decided that he would put an end to their bond right then and there. At that moment, the fly landed on Mackenzie's bald head, and Capsidy, noticing it there, looked seriously at Mackenzie, saying that the fly was there. Capsidy's magic activated and fire appeared around him, to which Capsidy himself shouted for Mackenzie not to move and stand still. Mackenzie noted Capsidy's bloodlust and, saying that he was a former silver adventurer anyway, also prepared to attack, asking that Capsidy not think he would retreat. Mackenzie jumped up, about to attack, and Capsidy, frowning, angrily asked, didn't he tell Mackenzie not to move? He swung and hit Mackenzie on the head, trying to hit the fly. The force of the impact was so high that Mackenzie not only fell to the ground, 
but went through the wooden floor with him, getting stuck in the ground. Only Mackenzie's legs and arms were visible, and the adventurers watching this small battle screamed. They said that this was madness, because Capsidy dealt with the head of the guild with just one blow. Pephemia ran up to Capsodius and, hugging him, exclaimed that this was simply amazing, noting that this was expected of him. At that moment, Capsidy looked doomedly at his palm, where there were no traces of a crushed fly, and, turning around, said that he would go. The fly continued to fly next to Capsidy, but he did not pay attention to it, and at that moment Mackenzie asked who is Capsidy. Capsidy, turning to Mackenzie, called him grandfather and asked why he was hiding. He suggested that something had happened, and Mackenzie shouted out that Capsidy himself had done it. Capsidy thought for a moment, and then remembered his blow and asked himself, had he really just defeated the head of the guild? He noted that initially it may not seem so, but demi-liches are a race with superhuman strength. Because they are half dead, they can use powers beyond normal human capabilities, and right now it has superhuman strength. Capsidy realized that while he was possessed by this fly, he accidentally removed the limitation of his own power, and holding out his hand, asked if Mackenzie was okay. Mackenzie asked why he should even bother with this. He admitted that he had underestimated Capsodius' capabilities, and said that he had passed the test. The secretary approached Mackenzie, who was still half stuck in the ground, and asked if he was sure he was okay. Mackenzie admitted that from this blow his whole life flew before his eyes, and Capsidy, hearing this, noted that he was still half-lick. Pophimia asked enthusiastically, isn't this amazing? She exclaimed that now they could be adventurers together, and Capsidy, on whose back Pophimia had jumped, thought displeasedly that her face was too close. At that moment, Sharon approached them and congratulated Capsidy. Capsidy noticed how Sharon clasped her trembling hands and asked her forgiveness, suggesting that he had scared her a little. Sharon exclaimed that everything was wrong and admitted that she was just worried about Capsidy. Capsidy put his hand on her head and, after asking again, noted that Sharon was really a good person. Sharon lowered her head in embarrassment, saying that this was not the case, and suddenly Capsidy noticed a small object that flew towards him. He caught it, and Mackenzie, who at that time climbed up, told Capsidy to take it and leave, because he deserved it. Capsidy examined the object he had caught, and the secretary, also taking a closer look at it, exclaimed that it was the badge of a silver adventurer. No one could believe that the newcomer had already become a silver adventurer, and Capsidy, frowning and clenching his teeth in irritation, asked if they were kidding him. He knew that if he accepted this, he would stand out, and throwing the badge somewhere behind his back, he said that this was some strange nonsense, so he didn't need it. Mackenzie shouted indignantly, promising that he would kill Capsodius if he did not become a silver-ranked adventurer. Capsidy asked if he really needed to hit Mackenzie again. He asked if it was Mackenzie who doubted him and gave him a special exam. Capsidy exclaimed that he would never take silver rank from him and asked if Mackenzie was going to take responsibility after starting a fight with him. Capsidy thought for a moment, deciding that he would start with the iron rank and then see what to do next. He admitted that he was not yet ready to work as a high-ranking adventurer, especially since he only had the first level. Mackenzie asked in shock, and Sharon confirmed this, saying that she had already appreciated Capsidy. Capsidy asked if Mackenzie could see this. He said that even Sharon confirmed this and added that he was just lucky. Mackenzie thought about it, and Capsidy thanked him for it. Pephemia exclaimed that she was content to be an iron rank adventurer. But someone said that it had already been decided that Pophimia would be at the bronze rank, noting that being above the bronze rank was already expensive. Pophimia exclaimed that she wanted to seek adventures with Capsidy, but Capsidy, turning to Pophimia and taking her shoulders with his hands, said that she would be with a bronze rank. Pophimia again repeated that she wanted to be with him, and Capsidy, noting that she did not understand, said that as her master, he said that she needed training now. Pophimia, almost in tears, asked, is it possible without training? Capsidy turned away, explaining that if he constantly helps Pophimia, then she will never learn anything, and Pophimia realized that if this happens, then she will only slow down Capsidy. Capsidy said that if she wants to travel with him, she must first reach his level so that, looking forward, he can see her development. Pophimia burst into tears and, catching up with Capsodius as he began to leave, hugged him. Capsidy also hugged Paphimius, and she promised that she would try. 
Capsidy thought happily that everything was going as he had planned, because Paphemia's potential was at the highest level, and she had already received the status of a heroine, and after she gained experience, she would reach the stage where she could get an audience with the king. And then she will have parades during the day, and events with the participation of representatives of high society at night. Paphimia has a glamorous life ahead of her in the royal palace, and she will probably end up forgetting all the minor things in her life, such as Capsidy. Capsidy smiled, noting that at this time he would have a quiet life in which he would not be exploited, and mentally thanked his first level. Paphimia, running up to Sharon, promised that she would make every effort to do this, and the secretary said that there was a quest that they would like Paphimia to complete as soon as possible. She added that this could be a very difficult opponent for Paphimius, as she still does not have enough experience in battle. Paphimia exclaimed that there would be no problem with this, because, after all, she was the heroine that Sharon chose. Capsidy, listening to this, smiled and thought that this spirit was good, and after that he decided that it was time for him to go. The secretary, meanwhile, explained to Paphimius that the one he had to fight with was a man with a huge figure who was incredibly smart and also wielded a dragon tooth sword. The secretary added that, in addition to this, the enemy specialized in death magic, and they were told that he had eight souls. Capsidy froze, turning around in fear, and the secretary, showing a sheet of paper with the task, said that the enemy's name was Vazag, who was a berserker with a level above 100. Capsidy remembered how he sat near the body of the murdered Vazag, stuffing his sword into his bottomless bag. The secretary at that moment said that they were not asking Paphimia to do this right now, and Paphimia, exchanging glances with Sharon, laughed and said that they did not want to say this, but Vazag was already deader than all the dead. Someone hearing this asked in bewilderment if this was serious. Paphimia confirmed this, and turning around, pointed her finger at Capsodius, who was trying to leave unnoticed, and exclaimed that it was thanks to him. Capsidy froze and, sweating from exertion, slowly turned towards the adventurers. At this time, somewhere far from the guild, someone activated a fog storm, and a tornado appeared, sucking people into itself, tearing them apart with strong currents of wind. Ruviana, who controlled this spell, sighed, and after that, noticing something below, she called out to Vagnes, ordering him to hurry up and send the soldiers. However, Vagnes did not do this, but only grinned and activated a tidal wave. A magical attack appeared, and Ruviana, hovering in the air, indignantly asked what Vagnes was doing. Vagnes turned to her and asked if they shouldn't just kill more people. Ruviana called him names and told him to just follow the plan, asking if he understood. Vagnes asked Ruviana not to worry about little things, and, turning away from her, grinned and said that the main thing was to kill opponents. Ruviana, angry, shouted out the name Vagnes, and he said displeasedly that he understood everything. Looking around, Ruviana realized that the Resurrectors were failing, and remembered that Vagnes was originally tasked with wreaking havoc on the front lines, but, like Ruviana, he was not suited to being a leader from the rear. Ruviana said sadly, when Capsidy was with them, he always came up with smart battle strategies and thought that no one understood the gravity of the situation. Capsidy, the day before every big battle, no matter how busy or tired he was, always came to them with another brilliant strategy, made all the battle plans, negotiated between all the demon races, and came up with four heavenly monarchs, while they were all just an addition. Ruviana realized that without Capsodius, the army of the demon king was completely useless, and suddenly she heard someone calling out to her. Turning around, Ruviana saw a man below who began to form a fiery magical attack. It almost hit her and Ruviana fell to the ground. Vagnes ran to her, and Brazel, coming closer to them, asked what the problem was. Vagnes and Ruviana rose to their feet, and Vagnes exclaimed that Brazel had saved them. Brazel ordered Vagnes to return to the vanguard, and Vagnes asked again indignantly. Brazel explained that he doesn't give orders at all, so he has to go to the vanguard, and Ruviana asked who would be in the rear then. Brazel asked her not to forget that he was the commander-in-chief of the Demon King's army, and added that he would leave command of the army to her. Ruviana said that she didn't mind, but asked Brazel not to forget that the Demon King is the supreme commander of all of them, so Brazel shouldn't be mistaken about this. Brazel smirked, and Ruviana, mentioning his toughness, asked if he looked down on the Demon King. She admitted that she had never said anything like that, but now that Brazel mentioned it, it would be correct. Brazel, without answering anything, simply turned around, 
preparing to leave, and Ruviana, angry, asked where he was going. She exclaimed that there were still enemy troops here that needed to be finished off. Brazel explained that he was returning to the royal city with a report, saying that he had unfinished business there. Ruviana asked displeasedly what could be more important than finishing off the remaining enemies. She suggested that he planned to lock himself in his laboratory and deal with his little toys, and Brazel, looking at Ruvian, asked if she knew the importance of these toys. He replied that someday she would understand this, because when it was completed, it would change the outcome of the war. Ruviana, looking angrily at the disappearing Brazel, mentally turned to Capsidy, asking what they should do next. Some time later, outside the window of the room, birds were singing, sitting on a branch, and Capsidy, hearing this, realized that it was already morning. He remembered that yesterday he had been unable to escape from the adventurers, and as a result, he was thoroughly questioned about the incident with Vazag. After that, since neither of them had money, they stayed in the same hotel. Capsidy suddenly heard someone calling him and opened his eyes. The man who called Capsidy continued to call his name, asking him to wake up, and Capsidy's eyes widened in surprise to see a naked Pophimia next to his bed. She laid her head on Capsidy's chest and, crying, continued to call in. Capsidy was surprised and confused by what he saw, and, touching Paphimius's head with his hand, he called out to her. Paphimius stood up abruptly and looked at him. She hugged Capsidy, shouting his name loudly, and Capsidy asked in bewilderment what she was doing. Capsidy sat down, looking at Paphimius in horror and screamed, and the birds outside the window were also scared when they heard all these screams. Capsidy still did not understand what had happened, and Paphimia, without explaining anything, began to cry again and hugged him. Capsidy mentally asked, shouldn't Paphimia sleep in a separate room? Paphimia at that moment exclaimed that she was very glad that Capsidy had returned to life, and he asked himself in bewilderment, what does it mean to come back to life? He suddenly noticed that she was without clothes, and, mentally turning to Paphimius, asked if she was not too intrusive now. He assumed that she was trying to be more than just a student to him, and wondered if now that he was in human territory, his popular phase had come. Capsidy thought that the heroine and saint of prophecy were next to him, and asked Cupid what could he be thinking about. Capsidy asked Paphimia, who continued to hug him, to calm down and Paphimia, pulling away, asked for forgiveness and admitted that she was just worried. Capsidy didn't understand why she acted this way, but he thought it was to be expected. He asked Paphimia to get off him, saying that it would be bad if Sharon saw them like this. And suddenly Sharon's voice was heard, who said that she had been here for a long time. Capsidy noticed how Sharon lifted the blanket that was covering Capsidy and looked out from behind it. Capsidy exclaimed in fear that she was also here, and looking at the crying Sharon, asked why she was also naked. Sharon said Capsidy's name and started crying even harder, and Capsidy asked why she was crying. He mentally asked not to be told that he had made such a mistake with such an innocent girl, thinking that he really wanted to experience bitterness and sweetness throughout his youth, however, his heart could not stand it if a hare suddenly jumped out. Capsidy noted that for his human heart the clock stood still centuries ago because he is a demon. In the end, Capsidy suggested calming down first and asked what Paphimia and Sharon were doing here. Paphimia calmed down a little, but there were still tears in her eyes, so she could burst into tears at any moment. She exclaimed that Capsidy's heart stopped, and Capsidy froze in surprise. Sharon, wiping away her tears with her finger, added that Capsodium's body was very cold, and they wanted to warm it with their bodies. Capsidy did not answer, continuing to smile, but realized that he was half-lick, and his body moved with the help of magic, and his heart did not beat. Outwardly, he looked calm, but he thought with horror that it would be bad if Paphimia and Sharon guessed. He didn't know what to do, but he told himself to calm down, noting that it didn't look like the girls would expose him. Capsidy understood what could be done in this case, and told Paphimia and Sharon to get dressed. The girls were horrified, as if only now they realized what shape they were in, and ran to get dressed. Capsidy thought he had captured the scene in his own memory. When Paphimia and Sharon got dressed, Capsidy apologized for making them worry and said that he was fine. He corrected his words, saying that he was fine all the time, and Paphimia asked, puzzled, what did he mean? Capsidy asked if she remembered what he said about training in the mountains. He thought he had actually done this during his travels and said he didn't know if they believed him or not, but that was the type of training. 
Sharon and Pophimia asked in bewilderment, and Capsidy explained that among the demonic races, there are those who are able to use the magic of the death attribute, which is extremely dangerous. He added that just one spell of this attribute is enough to instantly kill any opponent regardless of their strength, and seriously said that if such a spell stops his heart, then his body already knows how to start it again. Sharon and Pephimia, having listened to Capsidy's explanation, screamed enthusiastically, and Capsidy mentally thanked them for such gullibility. Pephimia hugged Capsodius, and he thought that he was lying so well that he was ashamed of himself. Capsidy decided that, in any case, he needed to get out of here as quickly as possible, and at that moment Pephimia, sensing something, exclaimed that she had forgotten about the baking. Capsidy asked again in bewilderment, but Pophimia did not answer, but simply ran out of the room, talking about bread. Rising from the bed and starting to get dressed, Capsidy asked if Pophimia really knew how to cook. Sharon replied that Pophimia really helps her a lot around the house and can probably do anything. Capsidy looked at Sharon, who stood on a few boxes and began to take out plates, and suggested that she could succeed in this. But at that moment, Sharon slipped and almost fell, but Capsidy managed to run up to her in time and catch Sharon. Setting Sharon on her feet, Capsidy handed her the plates and Sharon thanked him. Capsidy advised her not to overexert herself, and Pophimia explained that after Sharon accepted the powers of the Saint of Prophecy, she did not leave the royal palace, and now, most likely, she got out for the first time, and all his companions died at the hands of Vazag. Capsidy said he understood and thought Sharon had a really hard life. Soon everything was ready, and Capsidy looked delighted at the hot food standing in front of him. He broke the warm bread, from which steam was still rising, and, having tasted it, exclaimed that it was very tasty. Looking at the food, he asked himself how long it had been since he had eaten normal food. Capsidy remembered when he was in the demon territory, he was so busy with work that he couldn't even eat properly, so he had to eat nutritional pills. Pophemia smiled and said that she could cook this every day if Capsidy liked it so much. Capsidy asked if she really said she would do this every day. Pophemia confirmed this, and Capsidy, looking at the food, asked if they were going to stay at this hotel tomorrow too. Sharon and Pophemia said they were going to do it, and Capsidy admitted that he was pleased to hear it. He thought he wouldn't mind staying at the same hotel while he was in town and continued eating. Pophemia decided that it was time for her to eat too, and Sharon, turning to Capsodius, asked if he had any plans after that. She explained that the two of them were going to go to the armory to buy some equipment for Pophemius. Capsidy thought about it, noting that he could find out how much human currency was worth, and said that that was great, suggesting that after that they go to the guild. Pophemia and Sharon agreed. A little later, in a weapon store, Capsidy looked around, looking at the armor and weapons on display, and thought that there was a very large selection here. Pophemia and Sharon also looked around enthusiastically, and the seller, noticing the visitors who had arrived, said welcome to them. Sharon said hello and said her name, and Pophemia, also saying her name, exclaimed that she had a bronze rank. The seller said that they had already been notified, and, pointing to the desired part of the store, asked to follow him. Sharon invited Capsidy to go with them too, but he refused, deciding to just look around. Pophemia asked him to wait here, and Capsidy, waving his hand at her, agreed to this. The woman who remained next to Capsidy imagined herself, saying that this was quite unexpected, but her name is Flea McKetton, and she is a salesperson in this store, and although she is a second-year student, she uses the sales pitch that she mastered while working in the sales department. She noted that in a clothing boutique, regardless of the type, all the buyers go to her, and no matter who it is, she will resell everything she can there. Flema decided that at the moment her target was this guy, and, looking at Capsodius, noted that at first glance he looked like just a beggar, but her instinct told her that he was saving money. She guessed that he was an adventurer who looked worse than a homeless person, and at the same time probably saved every penny, and noted that this month's recommended magic armor was perfect for this guy, and while he was buying it, she would talk him up and sell him everything. At that moment, Capsidy was walking around the store, looking at the items on display, saying that there were a lot of options here. Suddenly, Flema approached him and asked if she could tell him anything. Capsidy refused, explaining that he was just here for company, but Flema, not paying attention to his words, said that they had a huge assortment, so Capsidy would definitely like something. Capsidy, awkwardly putting his hand on his head, noted that Flem had a truly demonic smile and asked himself if she was really human. 
He suggested that in human society there is a rule that if he refuses, he will be cursed by a demonic smile, and thinking about the fact that humanity is scary, he decided that he agreed with this. He said out loud that he was just looking at the assortment, and Flema, turning her head slightly to the side, exclaimed joyfully. Capsidy asked again, but Flema, smiling, said that she had not said anything. She asked what Capsidy was looking for, weapons or armor. Capsidy thought that he was not looking for either one thing or another, however. Looking at the sword hanging on the wall nearby, he said that he wanted a weapon. He assumed that if he said armor, he would have to take off his robe, and although Sharon and Pephimia have already seen, he does not want to expose his body if possible. The thing is that the bodies of half-liches are dead, and Capsidy uses various magic on this to move, so depending on the person, some people may feel something. But instead of weapons, Flema, smiling, offered Capsidy magic armor. Capsidy asked himself if she was listening to him at all. Knocking on the armor, Flema said that this armor was made of mithril and increased physical defense by an amazing 40 points. Flynn winked at Capsidy, and he personally asked if she meant surprisingly little. Flema was shocked by these words, and Capsidy thought that he could tell whether it was mithril or not just by looking at the armor. Flema trembled and asked, What is Capsidy saying? She said that 40 units was quite a lot, and Capsidy suggested that it was a lot for a low level. He thought that in a demon lord's army, they would never wear this, and Flema sighed and noted that Capsidy was quite a formidable client. She added that this armor has not only physical protection, and Capsidy, interrupting Flim's words, guessed that it had magical protection too. Flema asked in bewilderment how he knew. Capsidy said that it was magical armor, and mentally asked if she really thinks that she is doing and does not know about such things. Flema exclaimed that this was indeed magical armor, and stuttering began to say how many extra points this armor gives. Capsidy again interrupted her words, asking if this gives 300 points. Flema muttered that this was worth 30 points, and when Capsidy asked again, she exclaimed that this was absolutely true, and calling Capsidy McCoy, said that the armor gave an additional 300 points. Capsidy asked what kind of McCoy. He noted that the armor was just useless junk, thinking that his robe had magical protection in the region of 500. Flema fearfully repeated that Capsidy called the proposed product rubbish, and Capsidy, noticing the expression on Flim's face, asked what it was. He noted that she had turned a little pale, and Flema awkwardly replied that he should not pay attention to it. Capsidy agreed with this, and Flema asked how about trying on the armor at least once. She said that he would look much more stylish than he does now. Capsidy clenched her teeth in irritation, thinking that Flema was very persistent. He asked himself why she was so aggressively forcing him to try on this armor. Capsidy suddenly realized something and, opening his eyes wide, asked not to be told about it. Flema, meanwhile, said that the glossy layer was more suitable for another use, but Capsidy, not listening to her, pressed Flema against the wall and, bending over her, seriously told her not to tell him that she knew who he was. Flema asked in horror what he was talking about. Capsidy got angry and shouted at her not to pretend to be a fool. He admitted that he thought she was an ordinary salesman, but it turned out that she was not so ordinary. Flema assumed that Capsidy was giving her a compliment and said that he guessed right, because she is called the master of this store. Capsidy thought that he was not sure about this, because Flema tried to persuade him to try on the armor to check his body. He noted that this was very mean, and Flema, grabbing Capsodius by the cloak, shouted at him to just take off this mantle. Capsidy refused, and Flema, angry, asked if he really didn't believe her, the foreman of this store. Capsidy shouted that she was simply crazy, and said that this was why she would never take off his robe. Flema asked displeasedly, what kind of disgusting attitude is this? And at that moment, the door leading to the main part of the store opened, and the man, who had previously left to show Pathemius and Sharon weapons, asked what they had done here. Flema, turning to the manager, asked him to just listen, and told him that Capsidy refused to try on the magic armor. Capsidy exclaimed with displeasure that Flema was trying to take off his robe, and asked the manager to do something, since he was Flema's boss. Flema indignantly asked if she was forcing him. She recalled that she was the master of this store and admitted that she had never met customers like Capsidy. The manager silently watched Flema and Capsidy sitting on the floor opposite each other for some time and, going up to Flema, took her by the collar of her blouse, lifting her to her feet. Bowing slightly, he asked Capsodius for forgiveness, and Flema called out to the man in bewilderment. 
The manager said that she was fired, and Flema was very shocked by these words. She asked if he was sure about this. Flema exclaimed that without her, the master, this small store would go bankrupt, but the manager calmly replied that she had never been a master. Capsidy looked at the manager in bewilderment, and Flema exclaimed indignantly that the manager always called her a master. The man explained that back then they were alone every time, but from the moment she came here, Flema behaved impudently and never sold a single thing properly. Capsidy continued to stand, motionless, and look at the manager and Flim talking. The manager, meanwhile, said that he tolerated Flim for two years because his friend introduced her, but nothing more. He noted that after he pays Flema today, she is fired. Turning to Capsidy, the manager again asked for his forgiveness and offered to accept the gift as an apology. Capsidy, awkwardly putting his hand on the hood of his robe, realized that this was just a misunderstanding, but exclaimed that it was good. He thought that he should have tried on the armor then, and, putting his hand on the shoulder of Flynn, who had already turned around, with a smile he asked her not to worry, explaining that he had also recently been fired, so he understood her. Capsidy added that this is just a weapons store, and not Flema's whole life, but Flema did not react to his words, continuing to cry. At that moment, Capsidy was called out by Pafimia, who, showing new armor and equipment, asked if she looked good. Capsidy, looking at Flim, said that he looked good, but thought dissatisfied that the bell hanging on Pathimius's neck was ruining everything. Sharon exclaimed that it really suited her, and Capsidy, noting that they were now completely ready, offered to go on the mission. When Pathimia, Sharon, and Capsidy arrived at the guild, the secretary explained that tasks were divided into three categories. The first is extermination quests, which are mostly quests to destroy monsters. The second are collection quests, which involve collecting various countries, resources, materials, and valuables from dungeons. And the last category is assistance quests, which include quests to harvesting, cutting down trees, and the like. She added that since Pophimia was an iron rank, she could choose any category of mission, and Pophimia, happily exclaiming that this was great, decided that she would take the extermination mission. She said that she would destroy many monsters and become stronger, and, taking the piece of paper extended by the secretary, she thanked her for it and began to study what was written there. Pophemia read it with concentration, and after that she showed the piece of paper to Sharon, and Sharon, having also studied what was written, suggested Pophemia what she could take. Having chosen the desired task, Pophemia said that she would take it, and Capsidy decided that she would take the collection task. Pophemia, jumping on Capsidy's back, plaintively called his name, but Capsidy said that he was done with hunting monsters. He turned on mentor mode and added that if they hunted in the same area, it would stop the development of Pafimius. Pafimius shouted out the name Capsidy, and he smiled and thought that demons can tame monsters, and there are even those demons who can see through the eyes of tamed monsters, so he would never go to a place where he could meet this. The secretary, taking out a stack of sheets with tasks, asked if he would take the task of collecting magic herbs. Capsidy, trying to push away Pophimia, who was hugging him, said that this task was just right, and the secretary said that he needed to know something else. She explained that if Capsidy encounters monsters while completing his missions, he should not worry and just return to the city, adding that they cannot compensate for possible injuries, but they can buy the corpses of monsters at the market price. Capsidy, narrowing his eyes, asked himself, isn't this a red flag? A little later, Pophimia and Sharon walked through the forest, looking around warily. Pophimia noted that the monster must be somewhere nearby, and looking at the piece of paper she was holding in her hands, she studied the depicted drawing and information about the monster. She realized that it was a gov wolf and asked how strong it was. Pophimia told Sharon not to worry and promised to cover her in case of danger, and Sharon smiled and thanked Pophimia for this. She added that if necessary, she could create a protective barrier and showed this with her hands. Pophemia exclaimed joyfully that together with Sharon, they were comparable in strength to a hundred people, and suddenly a monster appeared and told them welcome to the place of their death. The wolf swung his paw with huge claws, trying to hit Pophemius, but she was able to parry this blow with her sword. The monster looked in bewilderment at the claw, cracked from the blow, and Pafimia, frowning, screamed and attacked the wolf with her weapon. The monster dodged, but Pafimia continued to swing her sword, trying to attack, and the wolf, smiling with its toothy mouth, noted that her attacks were strong, but she was very slow and inexperienced. 
Laughing, the wolf advised Paphimia to fight harder, and Paphimia continued to swing her sword with concentration. Sharon, in order to somehow help Paphimius, threw stones at the monster. However, the wolf took almost no damage, dodging every attack. Once again raising her hand to strike, Paphimia dropped her sword, and the wolf, noticing this, suggested that she calm down. However, Paphimia did not stop, continuing to fight with her hands, and the monster jumped back, thinking that Paphimia was merciless. Squinting, the wolf said that he was leaving, and when Paphimia asked him to wait, he shouted that he was not waiting, not stopping, not repeating. Turning around, the monster ran away, asking itself, what's wrong with this belligerent little girl? The wolf noted with displeasure that she had exhausted it, but suddenly stopped, looking in surprise at what he saw in front of him. The monster noticed Capsodius, who was collecting grass, and looking closely at him, asked himself, where could he have seen Capsodius before? The wolf thought it couldn't be him. At that moment, Capsidy, tearing out a bunch of grass from the ground, joyfully said that he had finally found the Rurura grass. Pulling out a bunch of grass, he thought it was a good thing he took the gathering mission, noting that it was very quiet here if not for those two, and he might also find some food. Suddenly Capsidy heard someone growl behind him and realized that the end of his rest had come. The wolf, who came closer to Capsidy, admitted that he did not think that he would meet here the weakest of the four heavenly monarchs, and Capsidy turned around, gritting his teeth and frowning, and realized that it knew him. The monster exclaimed that this name was Wolf Taro, and Brazil gave the name to the wolf. It added that it is a servant of hell and loves NTR. Capsidy asked, is this really the trend now? Wolf Taro, meanwhile, continued, noting that no one could have thought that an exile from the Demon King's army would walk through human territory. The monster noted that this was a direct betrayal, and promised that he would bite off Capsodium's head and give it to Brazil. Capsidy, turning away with disgust, told Volftero to die and activated the magic. There was a gurgling sound and foam poured out of the monster's mouth, and soon it fell to the ground dead. Capsidy asked himself, what's wrong with these monsters? He hoped that he had killed Volftero, as it was reported to him, and suddenly, looking at the collected grass, he saw that the quality of it was beginning to decline due to the fact that the grass was drying up. Looking at the corpse again, Capsidy remembered that the guild had mentioned that they would be willing to buy monster corpses at the market price, and said that Wolf Taro would cover his expenses. It turned out that Capsidy would regret his decision. A little later, Capsidy returned to the guild and, giving away the collected grass, received a reward of 70,000 paracuses for this. Taking the bag of money, Capsidy thought that it would be enough for a week at the inn, and remembered when he served in the army of the demon lord, his salary was one dry frog. Holding a small bag of money to himself, Capsidy noted that compared to a frog, this was a lot. He suddenly asked where Paphimia and Sharon were. The secretary replied that they had not returned yet, but did not have time to finish, as Sharon and Paphimia entered the guild. Paphimia was shaking with fatigue, and Sharon walked next to her, looking at her friend with concern. Capsidy congratulated them on their return, and Paphimia sadly said that she had returned. Capsidy, appreciating the appearance of Sharon and Paphimia, assumed that everything ended badly, and Paphimia sadly admitted that the monsters had run away from them. She noted that it was very agile, and said that her opponent was a ruthless wolf monster with a scar between its eyes. Capsidy asked, isn't this a gov? Paphimia asked in surprise, does Capsidy really know this? Capsidy produced the monster's corpse, explaining that it attacked him while he was collecting magic herb, so Capsidy killed it. The secretary looked at the monster's corpse in confusion, calling out the name Capsidy. Capsidy looked at the secretary in bewilderment, and suddenly noticed that the other adventurers, having seen the monster's corpse, were looking at Capsidy. He noted that there was some strange atmosphere around, and asked himself, did he really need to capture the monster alive? The secretary suddenly exclaimed that this was incredible, and when Capsidy asked again, she said that it was amazing, because the body had no cuts, no blood stains, and asked if Capsidy had used poison. Capsidy said that he did not use it, thinking that the monster died instantly, and the secretary enthusiastically said that it would be useful for science, and therefore the nearby museum and laboratories would begin to try to buy the corpse. Capsidy asked if this was true. The secretary, after thinking, suggested that they could offer more than a million paracuses, and Capsidy asked again in bewilderment. He was shocked by the amount he heard, and Pophimia, who also heard all this, noted that it was surprising, adding that Capsidy would become famous. 
Capsidy thought that this was bad, because rich people always stand out, and if this happened, his demonic side would be exposed. Capsidy imagined how they were chasing him with weapons, trying to kill him, and mentally cursed. The secretary at that moment decided that she would immediately contact the curator, but Capsidy said that if this gov is really of great value, then he will give it for free. Pophimia reminded him that he could become rich, and Capsidy realized that Pophimia was still inexperienced. Trembling, he waved away the images of money in his head and said that the development of science was more important than the reward right in front of him. He asked if Pophimia thought it would be better if they used this corpse. Everyone, including the adventurers standing nearby, froze, looking at Capsodius in surprise, and then began to scream enthusiastically. Sharon noted that this is very altruistic and said that Capsidy is amazing. Pophimia promised that she would never forget these words, and the other adventurers admired Capsodius's kind heart. Capsidy mentally asked if they were adequate. He thought he wouldn't mind as long as everything was in order and laughed and asked them to take care of the rest, saying he would leave it to them. Sometime later, walking past a beautifully decorated building, Capsidy remembered how he stood in front of a crowd of people, holding scissors in his hands, and someone announced that they would now celebrate the opening of the Capsidy Museum. Capsodius was asked to cut the ribbon, and he did so. For the moment, he thought the next few days flew by, even though a small museum was named after him. As he walked past the stalls, Capsidy heard people calling him, calling him Capuodia. They asked Capsidy to take the meat, which was simply magnificent, and Capsidy, passing by, hid his face with his hood, thinking displeasedly that he stood out very much. Capuodia was very similar to his name, and Capsodia noted that they even called him by his real name. Approaching the hotel, Capsidy was glad that Sharon and Paphimius were not there now, remembering that they had said that the mission location was quite far from here. He noted that he was very tired and had no time to recover, and entered the guild. Capsidy suddenly froze, looking in surprise at Paphimius, who was sitting on the floor, and Sharon, using magic to heal Paphimius' wounds. Coming closer, Capsidy asked what happened to them. Pophimia asked for forgiveness, and Capsidy, noting that she did not need to apologize for this, asked who did it. Sharon sadly replied that it was a monster, and Capsidy asked again in bewilderment. The secretary, coming closer to them, explained that recently a lot of monsters had appeared in the nearby forest, and ordinary adventurers were too weak, so she asked Paphimius to help, but she was too focused on protecting Sharon. Capsidy, thoughtful, noted that Pephemia should have gained more experience lately, and therefore assumed that this meant that the monsters were rather unpleasant. He asked if the monster had any special features. They explained to him that this one had sharp fangs, red eyes, and three heads, and Capsidy, repeating this description, asked himself, is this really Cerberus? He was very happy about this, noting that the characteristics matched. Capsidy introduced Cerberus, realizing that the dog missed him, the little rascal. The secretary at that moment asked what they should do. She asked if there were any other adventurers of bronze level or higher level. Capsidy, resolutely clenching his hand into a fist, said that he was with them, and Sharon, coming closer to him, reminded him that he said that he did not want to fight anymore. Capsidy noted that this was a special case, and Pophimia asked if he would really fight. She exclaimed that then she would also go, but Capsidy, placing his hands on Pathemius' head, said that she needed to heal her wounds, and therefore advised Pathemius to take a day off. Pathemia exclaimed displeasedly that she wanted to watch him fight, and Capsidy thought that he could not let her see his relationship with Cerberus. Closing his eyes, Capsidy said seriously that the monster was too strong and could harm Pathemius, so he must go alone. Pephimia desperately said that there were many reasons for her to go with him, and at that moment Mackenzie, who came closer to them, said that Pephimia needed to be more honest. He explained that Capsidy was literally saying that he couldn't win by covering for her, and Capsidy mentally thanked Mackenzie for that. In the end, Pephimia, albeit sadly, agreed, wishing Capsodius good luck. Cheryl also wished Capsidy good luck, and he, looking at her with a smile, promised that he would definitely return, since the goddess of victory was praying. The adventurers who were in the guild at that moment asked Capsodius to try his best, exclaiming that they would support him and wishing Capsodius to be careful. Capsidy, smiling joyfully, mentally turned to Cerberus, asking his pet to wait for him. At this time, in the land of demons, Ruviana, getting up from her chair, announced to Brazel that she was leaving. Brazel looked at her silently for a while, and then asked her to wait. 
Ruviana, looking displeasedly at Brazel, asked what is it. Coming closer to her, Brazel leaned towards Ruvian's ear and asked if she was free that night. He explained that he had found a bar that served excellent dragon's sake and asked if Ruviana would mind going there together. Ruviana, turning away from Brazel, apologized, but added that she already had plans for the evening. Vognis, who was the only one left sitting at the table, watched with displeasure as Brazel remembered that Ruviana had said the same thing last time. He assumed she was simply refusing and asked if that was true. Ruviana asked again, noting that Brazel too often goes into the past. Brazel asked displeasedly, what did she say? Ruviana, turning her back to Brazel, explained that she was busy with her pet today because he had been unwell lately. Brazel frowned, gritting his teeth in anger, and then, grinning, asked if Ruviana remembered the purpose of his research. Ruviana remembered the huge glass flasks that contained sleeping monsters and asked if he was talking about creating artificial chimeras. Brazel said that this was true and explained that he was going to study the cells of it to create an even more ferocious creature. He asked, how does Ruviana think about this idea? Brazel added that he had already created one monster as an experiment and said that in a few days he would receive important data and if he could create even stronger monsters, then his strength would be unshakable. He grabbed Ruvian's hand and pulled him closer to him, asking her to choose him over Capsodius. He noted that Ruviana thought highly of Capsodius's power, but reminded him that he had been exiled, so he no longer had power. Brazel wanted to say what would happen if Ruviana went with him, but suddenly stopped, realizing what he was saying. Ruviana looked at Brazel indignantly, and he apologized, admitting that he did not mean it. Vognis, who was watching this, was shocked, and Ruviana turned around and left. Brazel put his hand to his cheek, where the mark of the blow was visible, and sighed, and Vognis looked worriedly at his comrade, covering his mouth with his hands. Frowning, Brazel said that, in any case, in the end, absolutely everything will be in his power. Capsidy at that moment was running through the forest, mentally repeating the name Cerberus. He enthusiastically thought that he was already on his way to his dog, and running past a bush with berries, he picked a few pieces, remembering that Cerberus loves these berries, and therefore deciding to take some for this. Capsidy suddenly froze, hearing someone's screams, and turning around, saw adventurers lying on the ground and three pairs of eyes glowing in the shadows. Capsidy again mentally called his pet, however, as he came closer, he saw that three hydra heads were bending over the adventurers. The monster was about to attack the adventurers, but stopped when he noticed Capsodius coming closer to them. One of the adventurers, also noticing the presence of Capsodius, turned to him and asked if he really had an iron rank. He tried to stop Capsidy, exclaiming that he was no match for this monster, but Capsidy, not paying attention to the words of the adventurer, came closer to the monster and, angry, called it. He asked how dare a monster have such an appearance. Capsidy said indignantly that this made him worry, and all to no avail, and ordering the monster to listen, he said that in this world there is only room for one three-headed beast, and that is Cerberus. The Hydra, bowing its three heads, looked in bewilderment at the enraged Capsodius, and at that moment he asked if the monster knew why this was so he exclaimed that it was because he had decided that there was no one better in this world than his dear Cerberus. Capsidy imagined how he, with tears in his eyes, hugging his pet, and seriously asked how the Hydra dares to do this. Tears flowed down Capsodius' cheeks, and he repeated his question, but much louder and angrier. Frowning, Capsidy said that the time had come for the death of the Hydra, and having created a luminous magic circle, he directed this attack at the monster. The Hydra roared before falling to the ground, sending dust into the air. One of the adventurers, looking in bewilderment at the corpse of a huge monster, asked if the Hydra Lord had really died. Capsidy at that moment ran away, hiding among the trees, and the adventurers were surprised to note that he was gone. Capsidy, wandering through the forest, bit his lip with his teeth so as not to cry. He walked with his head down and sadly thought that it was not Cerberus. At that time, Cerberus was sitting, hiding behind the boxes, and listened in fear to something ringing nearby. The dog, trembling, asked himself why it all ended like this. Cerberus remembered that the previous owner always complained about this, although Cerberus did not want to hear it, and therefore was an annoying beast, and in comparison with him, the current owner is a very good person who will laugh and forgive everything that Cerberus does, even if it does what those are obscene things. 
Cerberus first remembered how Capsidy, crying, hugs him, asking him to listen, and then imagined how he licks Ruviana, who laughs and says to stop it. Hearing Ruviana approaching, Cerberus asked himself why she had changed so much. Cerberus pressed himself against the wall, trying to hide, and Ruviana, looking around, called her pet, saying that it was time to eat. Cerberus was horrified and realized that Ruviana was already close, and meanwhile she, looking around the corner, smiled and said that she had found Cerberus. Shaking Cerberus, Ruviana exclaimed that dust was falling from it. She decided that Cerberus would wash today, and Cerberus barked desperately. Smiling, Ruviana assumed that Cerberus was hungry and said that she had brought him some food. She showed a bowl filled with someone's remains. Eyes, bones, and teeth were visible in this, and Ruviana, holding the bowl closer, wished Bon Appetit. Cerberus recoiled in horror, and Ruviana noted that it had become very thin. She said that eating a lot is harmful, but it is also impossible to undereat, and asked Cerberus to open her mouth. When Capsidy returned to the guild, Pophimia, noticing him, burst into tears and, shouting Capsidy's name, ran up to him and hugged him, hanging on his neck. Capsidy closed his eyes, and Pafimia, wagging her tail with joy, congratulated him on his return. Capsidy asked her not to do this in front of everyone, and added that Pafimia was hurting him. He thought that there was something more important, and, trembling and crying, he noted that he still remembered Cerberus. Capsidy summed up the last few days, realizing that he could not find his beloved dog. Capsidy calmed down and, moving away from Paphemius, looked at Sharon, who, coming closer, congratulated Capsidy on his return. Capsidy thanked her for this, and Sharon smiled, but clenched her hands. Paphemia pressed herself against Capsodius again, and he looked at Sharon and Paphemius in surprise. He realized that he had made them worry and apologized for it, but Sharon replied that she believed that he would return. Paphemia asked how it went. She asked if Capsidy or the monsters won. Capsidy, introducing Hydra and Cerberus, said that he did something like this, and Paphimia and Sharon looked at him in surprise. The adventurers who were standing nearby and also heard this enthusiastically exclaimed that this was amazing. They couldn't believe that Capsidy killed the Hydra Lord. The secretary added that this was to be expected from Capsodius, and he indignantly asked if they really knew where he was going and why. They confirmed that this was so, and Capsidy asked why they didn't tell him anything then. Pophimia, approaching Capsidy, said that he was amazing, and Capsidy, looking at her, saw how Pophimia, smiling awkwardly, admitted that she also wanted to become a hero who could make everyone happy. Capsidy looked at the upset Pophimius and, remembering her battles, realized that recently she continued to lose. Sharon took Pophimius by the hands and said that she could do it. She admitted that she believed that Pophimia would succeed, and Pophimia, smiling, said that they would do everything possible. Capsidy suddenly heard himself being asked if he had proof that he had defeated the Hydra Lord. They explained to him that they wanted to report this task as completed, and Capsidy, thinking about it, noted that things were bad because he was too angry and completely forgot about it. He asked himself if he could say that someone else had defeated the monster. Capsidy didn't want a museum or anything like that built in his honor again and decided he would just go along with it. And at that moment, someone, putting the monster's horn on the floor, announced that the adventurer of the Iron Rank had forgotten something. Capsidy saw an adventurer who was in the forest at the moment when Capsidy killed the Hydra. Capsidy asked in bewilderment, and Sharon, looking at the huge horn, noted that this was without a doubt the horn of the Hydra Lord. The secretary, who also examined it, turned her gaze to the adventurer and asked if this was a quick flash of misteltum. The adventurers who also looked at Miss Deltham standing near the wall realized that he was indeed a silver-ranked adventurer who was among the top ten adventurers in the royal capital. Capsidy remembered that at the time of the battle with the Hydra, there was really someone else there, and having heard what they were saying about Miss Deltham, he asked himself if he was really a very famous person. The secretary, coming closer, assumed that he had defeated the Hydra Lord, and what Capsidy said was just a blatant lie. Capsidy, not paying attention to the indignant glances, turned to him, smiled, thinking that it was wonderful because he would be able to live again a calm life. Capsidy knew that he could not say that he simply forgot, and smiling, said that Misteltham looked bad, so he decided to give him the money for treatment. Misteltham simply silently looked at the awkwardly smiling Capsodius. Capsidy, watching Misteltham, mentally begged him to do this and tell everyone that he defeated the monster. 
Capsidy wanted Mistelthum to steal his credit, and mentally turning to the adventurer, continued to beg him to do so. However, Mistelthum, pointing his hand at Capsodius, seriously said that he himself did it. Capsidy thought doomedly that this was all. The adventurers shouted enthusiastically that Capsidy had worked well and said that they believed in him. Capsidy thought displeasedly that he could not believe that these people were reacting like that, and Mistelthum asked Capsidy why he returned home without a trophy. He frowned and asked if Capsidy really wanted to give all the glory to him. Capsidy did not answer, but simply smiled awkwardly. Pophimia, weeping with joy, shouted that Capsidy was very good, and, calling him a saint, asked him to lead them. The other adventurers also could not hold back their tears of joy, and Capsidy, looking at them, smiled, but ironically thought that they were calling him a saint. The next day, a glow was heard from the room as Sharon used magic to heal the wounds of the adventurer, who was lying unconscious on the bed. Mistelphim at that moment, taking Capsodius by the hands, thanked him, explaining that he and his partner lived together in the same village, but one day they were attacked and the village was burned to the ground, and this happened fifteen years ago. Mistelthum said that they worked very hard to take revenge, but somehow this monster became stronger, and they were unable to defeat it. He admitted that he was a little upset that he could not defeat this creature with his own hands, but said that he and his partner would remember Capsodius' kindness for the rest of their lives. He thanked Capsodius again, and he, looking at Mistelthum, thought that it hurt. Sharon, meanwhile, finished by saying that this should be enough. Mistelthum thanked her and, kissing Sharon's hand, noted that her strength was the same as they say. Mistelthum admitted that he was impressed and promised that he would repay Sharon someday. Sharon sheepishly replied that she was just doing her job, and Mistelthum, turning to Pephimius, realized that he was the hero who had been chosen by Sharon. Pephimius said that she was glad to meet Mistelthum. Mistelthum said that he heard about the incident with Vazag, clarifying that Pephimia lost and was unable to protect the saint. He also added that including this incident, Pephimia has been losing constantly lately and asked if she knows that Sharon chose her. Pephimia sadly lowered her head and Capsidy, noticing this, noted that Misteltum is a very straightforward guy. However, he also thought that all of this was true and Pephimius's success rate was around 20, even though she was doing everything in her power to perform as an iron rank and also considering how hard she worked. Sharon said that Pephemius simply does not have enough combat experience yet, and she is trying very hard to accumulate it now. Mistelthum asked how much time had passed since his arrival in this city. He asked if it was Sharon's idea to make Pephemius an adventurer. Sharon wanted to answer something, but Pephemia, putting her hand on her shoulder, asked Sharon to wait. Sharon looked at her in confusion, and Pephemia admitted that she was really ill-prepared, and in fact relied too much on the two of them, which is why she is not good enough now. That is why Pophimia, approaching Misteltum, asked him to train her. Misteltum asked again in bewilderment, and then, frowning, noted that she was mistaken if she thought that she could become stronger so easily. Pophimia exclaimed that she no longer wants to be a burden because she is a hero. She frowned decisively, and Misteltum looked at Pophimius, sighed and agreed, noting that he and his partner planned to stay in the city until they recovered. Pophimia thanked Misteltum, but he, turning to Sharon, advised her to thank Sharon. Misteltum asked if Sharon would mind. She said that she did not mind, and Misteltum, saying that this was good, expressed the hope that Pophimius' desire would not diminish. Pophimia resolutely exclaimed that she couldn't wait to work with Misteltum. Sharon, hearing this, was very moved, and tears appeared in her eyes, and Capsidy, watching Paphimius, smiled proudly. That day Capsidy did not say another word. Sometime later, Paphimia and Mistelthum fought in a clearing that had been cleared. Bushes were planted around the site, enclosing a makeshift arena, and at one end there was a bench. Paphimia, frowning, struck again, and Capsidy, passing by, saw how Mistelthum, dodging it, shouted that this was not enough because Pephimia was too slow. He asked, Is this really all that Pephimia can do? Capsidy, noticing that they were fighting without weapons, mentally asked Pephimius if she had really thrown away the sword. It was the fifth day after the start of training, and Capsidy remembered that Pephimia left him in Sharon and trained until exhaustion, and then fell asleep in his bed. Capsidy at that moment, having pulled off the blanket from Pephimius, shouted displeasedly that this was his bed, so she should not sleep here. Now, walking down the hotel corridor, Capsidy noticed Sharon sitting at the table. 
She was very sad, and Capsidy stopped and called out to her. He came closer, and Sharon, turning to Capsidy, congratulated him on his return. Capsidy thanked Sharon for this and, placing his palm on her head, realized that she was worried about Pophimius. Sharon did not deny this, sadly admitting that she thought that she really was dragging Paphimius down. Sharon wanted to increase Paphimius's confidence, but now she thought that there was some better way than this. Capsidy, thoughtful, noted that Sharon was very worried and asked why don't she go and visit Paphimius if she worries about her so much. Sharon looked at Capsodius in surprise and wanted to object, but he smiled and noted that six days had already passed, and therefore he was sure that Paphimia also wanted to see Sharon. Starting to walk in the right direction, Capsidy grabbed Sharon by the hand and dragged him along with him, thinking that if Sharon didn't go, it would be bad for Capsidy himself, and therefore, in order to protect his free time, he couldn't simply ignore its all attention. Thinking about how he would lie and read a book, Capsidy continued to walk to the place where Paphimia was training. Finally, they arrived and Paphimia, noticing their presence, asked in bewilderment if this was really Capsidy. Capsodius, waving his hand at Paphimius, greeted him and Paphimia, shouting his name, ran up to Capsodium, hugging him around the neck. Capsidy said that they had not seen each other for a long time, and at that moment Sharon looked out from behind him, who awkwardly noted that Paphimia had done a good job. Paphimia, noticing her, moved away from Capsodius and, saying that Sharon had also come, thanked her for this. After that, the three of them stood, not knowing what to say, and suddenly someone called out to Sharon. It was Mistelthum's partner, who, giving his name, admitted that he wanted to personally thank Sharon for curing him that day. Sharon told Verdant not to do this and admitted that she was glad he was okay. Sharon smiled, which greatly embarrassed Verdon. He asked if Sharon liked bread. Verdon noted that he was good at baking this, and then, noticing Capsodius, he ran up to him and realized that it was him. Verdon thanked Capsidy for saving him, and Capsidy replied please. Misteltum, who approached them, displeasedly asked why they came here. He noted that their training was in full swing and Capsidy, clasping his hands behind his head, asked if it was bad that they came to see the results of their training. Mistelthum thought about it and decided that he would show them these results if they wanted to see it that way. Turning to Paphimius, he asked, How about sparring? Paphimia agreed and Verdon sat down on the bench and Sharon and Capsidy stood next to him. Paphimia and Mistelthum took up fighting positions at some distance from each other. Paphimia frowned at the concentrated Misteltum and began to attack. Verdon fell asleep, and Capsidy noted with surprise that Paphimia was fast and said that he had not seen her for only three days, but she had already become much faster. But as he watched Paphimia swing to strike, he asked himself, how would that speed help her? Misteltum dodged the blow and tried to attack Paphimius himself. Capsidy and Sharon exclaimed excitedly that it was very close, and noting that Misteltem was already close, they asked Paphimius to try. Capsidy looked at the seemingly calm Misteltem, realizing that he had not taken a single step. He realized that Paphimius has very good abilities and has spirit, but she has absolutely no sense of battle, and her intuition and movement are very straightforward. Seeing Paphimia frowning and gritting her teeth from tension, trying to continue fighting, Capsidy realized that she was not suitable for fighting. Frowning, he noted that if she had enough time, she would become an excellent hero, but unfortunately, this time does not exist, because even while demons do not speak, they kill people. Paphimia suddenly stopped, lowering her hands, and Mistelthum asked what is it. He noted that the battle was not over yet, but Paphimia said that this was enough. Misteltum repeated these words in bewilderment and asked, Is this really all that Paphimia can do? Paphimia shouted that she could not do anything, and saying that she had completed many tasks and began to train under his leadership, and also moved away from her friends, noted that she was still weak. Paphimia began to cry, and Sharon, looking at her with concern, covered her mouth with both hands. Capsidy heard Misteltum say that Paphimia was surrendering, and asked again in bewilderment. Paphimia, wiping away a tear with her finger, shouted that she was giving up and could not become a hero. Capsidy cried out in amazement. Paphimia, falling to her knees, said doomedly that she would no longer be a hero. Sharon looked at her with concern, and Verdon, who had been sleeping before, woke up and looked at Paphimius in shock. Only Misteltum showed no emotion. Paphimia, continuing to cry, said that she was leaving because being a hero was not her calling. 
Capsidy suddenly, starting to shout the name Pafimia, ran to her and, without stopping, hugged her. Because of this, the two of them flew to the side, and Pafimia, screaming, said that she was in pain. Laughing, Capsidy said that she usually does the same thing, and asked if Pafimia knew about this. He noted that he was simply returning a favor for a favor, and Pafimia, asking Capsodius to stop, said that he should not do this. Capsidy agreed, but said that he had one question for Pafimius. He winked at her and asked what she was good at. Pafimia thought about it and dissatisfiedly suggested that these were physical abilities. Capsidy replied that this was the wrong answer, and Pafimia, standing up with Capsidy, admitted that she did not understand what he wanted. Capsidy, smiling, said that Pafimius's main strength is her spirit. Pafimia exclaimed in bewilderment, and Capsidy explained that even among the upper echelon demons, there is a shortage of strong personalities like her. And yet, among the demon race, no one has the same spirit, so Pafimia is the person with the strongest spirit in the world. Pafimia froze, looking at Capsodius in bewilderment, and repeated what he said. Capsidy said that all this was true, and asked Pafimia to first believe in herself. He explained that in the beginning you just need to put on courage, and advised Pafimius to hold his head high, straighten up and take a deep breath, and then move forward at her pace. Capsidy told Pafimia to just remember this, and Pafimia, after listening to him, frowned decisively. Capsidy, turning to the Mistelts, asked if he would be okay with another sparring. Misteltum, closing his eyes, said that he was not against it, but added dissatisfiedly that the result would not change. Capsidy waved his hand, calling Pafimius to him, and leaning towards her ear, when she came closer, he whispered something to her. Pafimia asked in surprise if he really didn't mind. Capsidy asked her to just try, and when Pafimia left, Sharon asked what Capsidy told her. Capsidy replied that he did not say anything like that, but simply gave Pafimius a little advice. Misteltum at that moment, standing opposite Pafimia, told her to attack, and Pafimia, frowning decisively, said that she would do it. She pushed off, starting to quickly run towards Misteltum, and Verdon, noticing this, asked in horror if this was really a direct attack. He noted that Misteltem would simply beat Pafimia again, but Pafimia at that moment simply continued to offend, and Verdon realized that Capsidy advised her to fold headlong as a shield bearer. He remembered that the Blood Wolf clan was known for their incredible durability, even among demi humans. Capsidy, smiling mysteriously, said that this was a good answer, but noted that Verdon was far from the truth. Looking at Sharon, Capsidy explained that all this was because Pafimia was her chosen hero. Sharon burst into tears and, shouting the name Pafimia, told her to go forward. Hearing her words, Pafimia opened her eyes wide, as if feeling stronger, and continued to attack, telling herself to move forward and hold on. She repeated these words over and over again, and, finally approaching Misteltum, grabbed him, pronouncing her every action, and, bending back, threw the perplexed Misteltum over herself. Misteltum did not even understand how this happened. Pafimia threw him with such force that Misteltham was half-submerged in the ground, and only his legs were visible. Capsidy, smiling, said that the game was over, and Verdon, looking at Misteltham, said his name in concern and shock. Pafimia froze at that moment, hearing someone call out to her, and Sharon, running closer to her, hugged Pafimia, congratulating her on her victory. Pafimia asked in disbelief if she had really won. Sharon confirmed this, and Pafimia, overjoyed, screamed, raising her hands in the air. Capsidy, crossing his arms over his chest, watched this contentedly, noting that the most problematic part of the heroes is that one cry of encouragement can give them strength. He remembered that he had witnessed cases where heroes, like zombies, extricated themselves from completely hopeless situations and thought that this was precisely their true strength. Watching the joyful Sharon and Pafimia, Capsidy noted that the current Pafimia is doing an excellent job of playing the role of a hero. Closing his eyes, Capsidy dreamily thought that sowing discord here would be beneficial for the demonic race. At that moment, Pafimia, hugging Sharon, suddenly asked her for forgiveness, admitting that she was very lonely. Sharon was surprised by this behavior, and Pafimia, pulling away, smiled and said that, as expected, she could not do anything without her. She admitted that she realized that everything she achieved was thanks to Sharon. Sitting down on Sharon's lap, Pafimia asked if she could continue to travel with her. 
Extending her little finger towards Sharon, she promised that she would definitely protect her, and Sharon, without hiding the tears that appeared in her eyes, smiled and, crossing her little finger with Paphimia's little finger, agreed and asked her to take care of her. Sharon called Paphimius a hero. A little later, as Verdon sat near the still-buried Misteltum, Paphimia turned to Capsodius and thanked him, happily noting that everything had gone as he had planned. Capsody asked if this is really true. He said that it was because Paphimia was constantly clinging to him, and while admitting that he had not tried her fist, he noted that he could tell that fighting was her great skill. Capsidy added that the next thing is to gain the courage to defeat any opponent, because if Paphimia adheres to her point of view, then everything will be fine. Paphimia asked if he was talking about her spirit. Capsidy exclaimed that this was true, and Paphimia, smiling, came closer to him and hugged him. Capsidy sighed, but did not move away but simply smiled. And suddenly he opened his eyes wide in surprise when he heard Paphimia talk about what needs to be caught and then thrown. Paphimia instantly did what she said, and Capsidy, finding himself in the same position as Miss Deltham, thought that he would never give Paphimia advice again. Paphimia at that moment asked for forgiveness, exclaiming that she did it reflexively. And someone laughed and noted that Miss Deltham had made a friend. At this time, on the land of demons, Ruviana, having finished writing something, collected several sheets of paper in a pile, and, looking at Vognes, sitting on a chair with her legs thrown up on the table, stood up and said that she was going to see Brazel for a minute. Leaving the room, Ruviana walked down the corridor, stopping in front of a large double door. Looking at this, she remembered that Brazel's research had recently attracted the attention of the Demon King, and therefore he was given a private office. As Ruviana began to knock, she thought it was supposed to be a joyful event, but in reality it was different. Ruviana said it was her, and upon hearing the invitation, she went inside. Brazel was walking at the table, and when Ruviana entered, he asked what was it. He asked if she wanted an office too. Ruviana, clutching a stack of papers, said that it would be nice, but noted that for now she was fine. Brazel asked why. Ruviana remembered Capsidy saying that if they split up instead of working together, it would be counterproductive, and also noted that working together was more fun. She also remembered how the four of them worked together, but Brazel never responded. Brazel said that she could always contact her if she changed her mind, and asked what business she had with him. Showing the sheets of paper, Ruviana explained that she had collected the documents as he asked, and asked if he could take a look. Walking closer to the table, she held out the documents. But Brazel, instead of taking it, grabbed Ruvian's hand and pulled him closer. Ruviana called out to him indignantly, and Brazel asked how about working together today. She replied that she could not, because she needed to feed her dog, and Brazel, leaning closer to her, asked if she could leave it to someone else. He noted that she always said this, but Ruviana apologized and explained that her dog had been unwell lately, adding that she had lost quite a lot of weight, and that was why she was very worried. Brazel replied that he could not accept this and asked why Ruviana always rejects him. He recalled that he was the strongest of the four monarchs, and at that moment the door to the office swung open, and the demon who entered exclaimed that he had a report. When he noticed Brazel and Ruvian so close to each other, he froze and Brazel frowned. Ruviana pulled away and moved a little to the side. Brazel looked at the demon with displeasure, and leaning his elbows on the table, activated the magic. A fire appeared next to him, but Ruviana, coming forward, shouted for him to stop. She asked, what is it? Brazel continued to look at the demon, frowning, and the assistant, trembling with fear, stammered and repeated that he had brought a report. He said that the recently tested Hydra Lord, whom they released a few days ago, was destroyed. Ruviana and Brazel were shocked by this news and asked again displeasedly. Brazel asked if he really said about a proven Hydra Lord, Holding his head, Brazel said doomedly that it was a chimera that he had released. He noted that this was impossible after all, the power of this should have been three times higher than the original, and it should have been enough to deal with an A and even its rank adventurer. Brazel, continuing to reason, desperately asked who did this. The demon, continuing to rise in price, said that they were investigating this matter however, judging by the research they have, it was done by people named Lightning Flash Misteltum and Indestructible Verdon. Ruviana thoughtfully said that she had heard about them, and added that they were silver rank adventurers widely known among people. She noted that they were quite problematic, but Brazel stopped her from finishing her sentence by slamming his fist on the table. 
He shouted that it was impossible, and admitted that he did not believe that the Silver Garnet adventurers were able to defeat his Hydra Lord. The demon said that at first they seemed to be stunned, but as soon as the researchers looked away for a second, the Hydra Lord was already defeated. Ruviana, frowning, suggested that it was some kind of poison, but Brazel said that this was impossible, because the monster was resistant to poisons, so it could not die from human poison. There was an awkward silence, and the demon, turning to leave, said that he would then inform the demon king. Brazel asked him to wait, and, noting that he had done the right thing by reporting this, said that this was the demon's reward. He activated the magic, sending fire towards the assistant, and the demon was burned alive in this. Ruviana looked at this with horror, and, turning to Brazel, indignantly asked what he was doing. Brazel called the demon an idiot, and asked how he could let him tell the demon king about his mistake. He explained that there are people who can defeat an S-rank monster, and what's more, they are not from the royal capital, but from the forgotten wilderness, so this is very important for the demon king's army. Ruviana said that she couldn't believe they didn't discover this sooner, and added that they, as heavenly monarchs, needed to unite together, but Brazel interrupted her words, shouting that they didn't need to do that. Turning his back to Ruviana, he said that it was his mistake, so he would deal with it himself. Brazel said that then there would be no more problems with them, and Ruviana, exclaiming that no one blames Brazel, wanted to say what they should do right now, but he turned on her and angrily ordered Ruviana to shut up. He asked if she really wanted him to destroy her like he did this guy. Ruviana looked at Brazel in fear, and he, taking out a map, pointed his finger at a place on it, saying that there was a city nearby. He noted that no matter how skilled they were, they must be injured and assumed that they had gone there to heal their wounds. Ruviana asked worriedly what Brazel was going to do. Brazel asked, isn't it obvious? He said that he would send fire monsters there, and, turning to the people, said that he would show them what happens when they make a fool of him. Ruviana, sadly lowering her head, listened to Brazel laugh. Capsidy at that moment, having caught the balloon, landed on the ground next to the little girl and gave it to her. The girl, smiling, thanked Capsidy for this, and he apologized for bumping into her. He asked the girl not to call him so respectfully, and the girl, waving goodbye to him, left. Capsidy waved back and suddenly noticed crows flying past him. The birds flew away into a dark, narrow alley, and Capsidy, watching this, followed the crows. As he approached, the birds turned into three people in cloaks, and Capsidy realized that it was really them. He turned to ease, Rado and Rito. Sometime later, a monster's paw with huge claws suddenly appeared from a magical portal. At the same time, several more of the same long arms appeared, and Sharon, sensing the presence of this, turned around. She screamed, and Pophimia, who at that time was standing near the registration desk at the guild, looked at Sharon and saw that she was sitting on the floor, covering her ears with her hands and breathing heavily. Coming closer to her, Pophimia asked Sharon what happened. Sharon, her eyes wide with horror, said that she felt terrible anger. In addition to Pophimia, the secretary and Mackenzie came closer to Sharon, and Pophimia asked what Sharon's words meant. The secretary suggested that this was a vision, and Mackenzie, thoughtfully, noted that it was possible that these were demons. Pophimia and other adventurers, who at that moment also began to listen, froze in bewilderment, and the secretary exclaimed that this was impossible, because this was just a village forgotten by everyone. She asked why demons would come here. Nobody understood this either. Sharon, sadly lowering her head, said that usually her visions were fragmented and unclear, but what she saw this time was a demonic army that had completely taken over this land. The adventurers, horrified, assumed that this time it would be accurate. At that moment, Misteltum entered the guild, holding a basket of bread in his hands. He had a bandage on his head and an apron over his clothes. Noticing Misteltham's appearance, the adventurers called out to him, and Misteltham, walking into the room, said that he felt a huge amount of energy. He explained that he felt a spirit being released earlier, and added that a huge number of lizards were heading towards this city from the west. After thinking, Misteltham said, since it suddenly appeared at the same time, it can only mean that a large amount of mana was transferred. The Mistelts estimated that there were about 10,000 monsters, and the adventurers, hearing the announced amount, shouted in fear. One of them realized that if they didn't figure it out, the whole city would be destroyed, and the secretary, turning to Mackenzie, asked what they should do. Mackenzie thought for a moment, stroking his beard, and decided that they would have to leave the city and evacuate everyone. 
The adventurers turned to the Mistelts and asked when the army was coming. He replied that it would be from noon to afternoon, and Mackenzie, saying that he understood everything, announced that he would talk to the mayor. He ordered the others to run, but Pophimia, resolutely clenching her hands into fists, exclaimed that she would not run away. Sharon, coming closer to the confident Pophimia, called out to her, looking worriedly at her friend. Mistelthum told Paphimius to stop, adding that she was not a hero yet, so she would not be able to defeat ten thousand demons. Paphimia, sadly lowering her head, took a long piece of bread from the table and, admitting that she was still weak, noted that it did not matter. Someone explained that it would be very stupid for Paphimius to go to fight without knowing the strength of his opponents, but Paphimia ignored these words and said that when he saw Capsodius, he understood something. She remembered that he went against the Hydra Lord without knowing anything about it, and also knew nothing about Vazag, but still saved them and the city. Pophimia noted how strong he was, and explained that therefore, it doesn't matter whether a person has a reason to protect people or not, or how strong the opponent is, only strength is needed to move forward. She declared that this was the quality that people wanted in a hero, and, exclaiming that she was the hero chosen by the Saint of Prophecy, she promised that she would destroy all demons. Pophimia put out her hand with bread and frowned decisively, and then said that this was the calling that was given to her, but corrected her words, suggesting that this was the reason why Sharon chose her. Pophimia took a bite of bread, and Sharon, not hiding the tears that appeared, looked at her proudly. Pophimia continued to eat bread, and the adventurers crowded around her smiled cheerfully. Raising his club and throwing it over his shoulder, Mackenzie exclaimed, If Pophimia says so, then they cannot retreat. Someone turned to Mackenzie and asked if they would really fight. Mackenzie apologized to Carla, explaining that she would have to go to the mayor in his place, adding that he had business to deal with. Miss Deltum, taking off his apron, said that he would also help. Someone called out to him, but Miss Deltum, taking a sword in his hands, interrupted the man's words, admitting that he wanted to bake some buns with his partner, but he would not be able to do this if the city was destroyed. He also said that if he allowed Paphimius to fight alone, he would never be able to call himself Lightning Flash again. One of the adventurers, looking at Mistelthum in shock, said that he was amazing and admitted that he did not think that Newville would be able to assemble such an army. The adventurers, visibly overjoyed, assumed that they could win. They believed that they could really do this, and, starting to talk, promised each other that they would show the monsters their secret technique. Pophimia, joyfully raising her hands up, thanked everyone, and Sharon, coming closer to her, said that Pophimia was amazing. Pophimia smiled and explained that as long as Capsidy was on her side, she would not run away. Hearing this, Mackenzie became thoughtful, asking, where is Capsidy? Pophimia and Sharon realized that he was not in the room and asked if he was not here. Mistelthum, crossing his arms over his chest, admitted that it would be great if Capsidy were here, but added that they could not always rely on him. Pophimia, frowning confidently, said that if she could not overcome even this obstacle, she did not think that they would ever be able to catch up with Capsodius. Mentally turning to Capsidy, she asked if this was so. A little earlier, standing in a dark alley in front of three cloaked creatures, Capsidy admitted that he was waiting for Rito, Rado, and Isu. He asked how they knew he was here. Isu, Rito, and Rado revealed that they had performed an autopsy on a proven Hydra Lord. Capsidy asked again in bewilderment, and it was explained to him that the proven version of the Hydra Lord, which Capsidy instantly defeated, was created by Brazel. Remembering the monster, Capsidy replied that this was not surprising and said, even if he was able to deceive the others, he could not deceive them, his former subordinates. Rito, Rado, and Isu confirmed this, and one of them warned Capsidy that he had better get ready. Capsidy looked at Rito. Rado and Isu in bewilderment, and suddenly a light shone and cloaked figures rose into the air. Capsidy froze, watching what was happening in surprise, and Isu, Rito and Rado, falling to their knees and bowing, asked Capsidy to help them. Grinning, Capsidy realized that they were looking for him. One of Capsidy's former subordinates handed him a huge stack of sheets, and Capsidy took it and began to read. He realized that this was a list of demon rebirths, and noted that there were approximately 10,000 of them. He said that this was quite a lot, but asked Isu, Rado, and Rito to pull themselves together. The demons at that moment stopped bowing and simply sat on their knees on the ground, and Capsidy, turning to Ease, remembered that he was a department manager and asked if this was so. 
The demon that Capsidy was looking at pointed to the man standing next to him, explaining that he was Rito, Esu over here. Capsidy fell silent for a while, and Rito, Rado, and Isu, admitting that they did not want to ask Capsidy for much, said that they would beg him for something else. Capsidy asked what's the matter. Rito, Rado, and Isu replied that they wanted him to help them with this list, and Capsidy mentally noted that he thought so. He asked if everything would be okay, even if he agreed. Capsidy said that Brazel would go berserk if he found out that he was helping them. Rito, Rado, and Isu exclaimed that some resurrections simply must take place, and indignantly added that Brazel himself was to blame. They began to complain that he forced them to work all day without sleep, so they admitted that they would start a war with him if he did not hire more workers. Isu, Rito, and Rado shouted that they needed more workers, and desperately said that they could not cope with 10,000 without Capsodius. Capsidy noted that this was a very large list, and thought that he had never seen Essa so tired. He realized with displeasure that Brazel was overworking them, and at that moment Rito, Rado, and Isu, clutching Capsodia's cloak with their hands, began to beg him again, promising that they would not tell anyone that he was here. Capsidy asked that they just not tell Brazel that he helped them, and Rito, Rado, and Isu froze and asked if that meant he would actually help them. Capsidy sighed and suggested that nothing could be done about it, and Isu, Rito, and Rado raised their hands up in joy. Observing his former subordinates, Capsidy thought that Brazel put too much pressure on them, and also noted that they were too cute. Sighing, Capsidy said that Rito would treat him later, but the demon that Capsidy looked at while saying these words said that he was Rado. Capsidy, without saying anything in response to this, asked when the deadline was. He was told that it would be in half a day, and Capsidy closed his eyes tiredly. He asked what did they just say? Rito, Rado, and Isu repeated that it would be in half a day, but Capsidy asked if they were talking about a whole day. However, he was again told that there was only half a day. Turning around, Capsidy began to leave, and Rito, Rado, and Isu thanked him. They added that they had secured one place and suggested we go there. Capsodius was sucked into the portal that appeared, and as he disappeared, he asked, Are they really kidding me? He cursed everyone and began the task. Monsters began to appear from the magic circle that appeared. At the same moment, in another part of the forest, an army of monsters was preparing to attack the city. One of the monsters, releasing a flame, set fire to several trees and suggested that Brazel too had fallen on hard times because he was using this to destroy the city. One of the monsters, turning to Rogan, asked what was wrong with Brazel. Noticing the dissatisfied face of Raghun, who asked Bagheera not to let his guard down, Bagheera noted that this is not a war, so Raghun can relax. Raghun noted with displeasure that the one who defeated the proven Hydra Lord was still here, as well as the one who defeated Dor. Bagheera, admitting that Raghun reminded him of something, noted that Brazel is bad with names. Raghun asked Bagheera to be silent, asking if Brazel wanted him to come up with a name for this one too. Bagheera said that he did not want this, and suddenly fell silent when he saw the approaching adventures. Ahead of everyone were Mackenzie, Pafimia, Misteltum, and Verdon. Pafimia frowned and looked at the monsters, and Rogan asked what it was. Bagheera explained that these were novel adventurers and noted that they were very brave. The monsters agreed that the adventurers looked warlike, but they couldn't see how many there were. Rogan again asked Bagheera not to lose his vigilance, because despair makes cowards courageous. Bagheera, running forward, shouted that this was not the case for them, and decided that he would simply use the flames of it to fry the adventurers to a crisp. Rogan tried to stop Bagheera, exclaiming that they had not even developed a plan yet, but Bagheera, ignoring these words, began to form a fireball and, turning to the adventurers, shouted that this name was Lord Bagheera, and his favorite genre was mutual love. Bagheera launched fire towards the adventurers, and they screamed in horror, but Verdon, coming out in front of them, put a shield in front of him, covering everyone from the flames. When the fire settled, Verdon grinned, and Bagheera asked in bewilderment if they had really reflected the flames of this. Rogan ordered Bagheera to return to duty, arguing that he could not do whatever he wanted. The adventurers, visibly delighted, watched the monsters, and Bagheera at that moment suggested that Rogan had forgotten that it had a large hard body and a tail, but Bagheera did not have time to finish his words, since Pafimia, having grabbed it, lifted Bagheera above the ground. Bagheera noted in bewilderment that he could no longer move and asked what this was. Pafimia, meanwhile, repeated over and over again that she had to catch it and then throw it, 
and using all her strength, she did what she said, throwing Bagheera far back. Hitting the ground, it died, and Puffimia, noticing this, exclaimed with joy that it was wonderful. Looking at Bagheera's corpse lying in blood, Roghun noted that this was impossible, because she defeated it with one blow. And suddenly Misteltum appeared behind Rogan, and Rogan, sensing someone's presence behind him, admitted that he was surprised that he was able to get behind this one. Rogan assumed that this was a famous adventurer and asked if he could tell him his name. Misteltham said his name, and Roghun remembered that it was a lightning flash, admitting that he had heard a lot about him. It wanted to say its name, but Misteltham interrupted Roghun's words, noting that there was no need for this, because he did not care about the names of those who would soon die. Misteltham swung his sword, cutting Rogan, and this, before dying, said that this was impossible, and also added that it was called Rogan, and it loved stockings. Other monsters, noticing the death of another comrade, were horrified, and Mackenzie ordered the adventurers to run forward to attack. He said that those who are stronger should go to the front line, adding that those who are injured should receive immediate first aid. The adventurers lined up as Mackenzie ordered, and the battle began. They used magic spells and weapons, and Sharon, standing a little to the side, healed the wounds of the adventurers approaching her. Some time later, when several more monsters were killed, Verdon exclaimed that this was surprising, because the number of enemies was decreasing every second. Mackenzie said that he could not lag behind the other adventurers, and also ran to attack, but his club was intercepted by someone's hand. Mackenzie froze, frowning, and the demon that appeared in front of him asked if that had just been an attempted attack. The demon noted that this was not a blow, and, attacking Mackenzie with his fist, exclaimed that this was a blow. The force of this attack sent Mackenzie flying far back and knocked him unconscious when he hit the ground. Noticing this, Pafimia restlessly called out Mackenzie's name and called out to Sharon, asking her to help him. Pafimia, Verdon and Mistelthum stood up against the demon who had thrown Mackenzie away, and Pophimia, frowning, asked who it was. The demon asked why Pophimia should tell this. Starting to look around at the adventurers standing in front of him, he paid special attention to Mistelthum and, exclaiming that he was very beautiful, admitted that he would have eaten him like that. The demon noted that the guy with the shield was also attractive, and at that moment Mistelthum, who jumped behind the demon, tried to attack, but it dodged and, calling Misteltum a barbarian, struck. Misteltum lost consciousness, and the demon suddenly heard someone calling out. Turning around, it was Verdon who, showing the demon his shield, asked if he wanted this mirror. Looking into the reflective surface of the shield, the demon enthusiastically noted that it was truly beautiful, and Verdon shouted to Paphimius that he needed to act now. Pophimia ran up to the demon, shouting that she needed to grab it and throw it, and, grabbing it by the leg, tried to throw the demon away, but froze, realizing with horror that she could not move. The demon realized that she was affected by the charm of this and asked if it was true. This sent Pephimius flying into Verdon, and the two of them were sent flying into a rock, hitting it hard. Pephimia fainted, and Verdon called out her name in concern. At that moment, the awakened Misteltum ran past him. Swinging his sword, he invited the demon to try it, and used the Susano lightsaber. A magical attack was sent towards the demon, and it exclaimed that this attack looked dangerous. Verdon stood next to Misteltum, and the two of them also sent a fiery shot towards the demon. The flames engulfed the monster, and Verdon, covering himself and Misteltum with a shield, frowned. A huge glowing sphere formed around the demon, and the adventurers standing nearby looked at it in surprise. Sharon, running towards Misteltham and Verdon, shouted their names, as well as the name of Pephimia. One of the adventurers tried to stop Sharon, but she continued to run, not paying attention to these words. When the spell dissipated, Varden and the Mistelts appeared in the dust, and Sharon was delighted to see them. She suddenly froze, her eyes wide with horror, as she noticed something else. The monster who remained alive noted that he never introduced himself and named this one. The adventurers who noticed the demon began to run away in horror, and High Dragon said that he lives with Brazel and is a warrior who fights for him. Showing Brazel's emblem, High Dragon announced that he was the general of the Lizardans and admitted that it was nice to meet him. Some of the adventurers asked in bewilderment, remembering that this was the second subordinate of the heavenly monarch Brazel. Someone, noting that High Dragon was second, said that it made it less scary, and High Dragon shouted at them to shut up. Because the first subordinate was Bastilin, however, it died, so now High Dragon is first. 
Sharon, who stood frozen in horror, said that this was impossible, and High Dragon, leaning towards her, asked why a child like her was here. Sharon fell to her knees, and High Dragon, looking at her clothes, noted that these were the clothes of high-ranking priests of the Agaria sect. High Dragon noted that he had seen these clothes many times, and added that the healing magic of priests brings many problems. Sharon continued to sit without answering, and High Dragon asked if it was true that she was a saint. After apologizing, High Dragon announced that he was going to break Sharon to death, and forcing her to bend to the ground, grabbed Sharon by the chest. The adventurers who saw this shouted Sharon's name in horror, but realized that they could do nothing. They continued to fight with other monsters, and High Dragon, meanwhile, lifted up Sharon's clothes and hit her on the butt with his palm. It noted that Sharon was a very nice girl and admitted that she just wanted to play. Sharon cried and High Dragon, sticking out his long tongue, touched the tip of it to her cheek. And suddenly someone screamed, ordering him to stop. The adventurers and demons froze and looked in bewilderment at Capsodius, who appeared in front of them. Capsody stood, breathing heavily, his arm extended forward and sweat running down his face. The adventurers shouted the name Capsodius. Cursing, Capsidy did not answer, but simply continued to stand, trying to catch his breath. The adventurers again called out to Capsodius, but he did not answer, and Hydragon peered thoughtfully at Capsodius. Capsidy sat down on the ground to rest, and, putting his hand forward, asked for a break, announcing that he was very tired. Capsidy remembered how a few hours ago, outside of Noville, he slammed the death note shut, wearily declaring that this was the end. One of his assistants was lying on an open book, and the other two were stuffing the monster into the bag. Capsidy lay down on the surface of the table, noting that he had resurrected 7,000, and they had 3,000, so the total was 10,000 in half a day. He realized that this was a new record, and one of the demons admitted that this was to be expected from Capsodius. Capsidy noted that Isu, Rado, and Rito also did a good job. The demons at that moment, having created a portal, said that they would now deliver the goods, declaring that everything else was theirs. Capsidy agreed with this and turned to Rito. The demon, whom Capsidy looked at, asked what is it. However, another subordinate added that this is Isu and Rito is him, but Capsidy tiredly replied that he no longer cares. Isu, Rito, and Rado commented that it was rude, and Capsidy remembered that they had said that Brazel had big plans. He asked if they knew where he was going to start the next war. One of Capsodius's former wards asked if they hadn't told him about this. He announced that it would be right here, and Capsidy, eyes wide with fear, asked again. The demons assumed that the fiery army had already gathered in the west, and Capsidy, cursing, exclaimed that this was the strongest army of Brazel. He asked what had happened here, in the wilderness. Isu, Rado, and Rito asked Capsodius to calm down, and explained that it was because he had defeated the Hydra Lord. They added that because of this, Brazel became angry and used high-level magic to move troops here. Capsidy fell to his knees, calling Brazel an idiot and asking if he could have done it with such magic. He suddenly realized that in order to use such high-level magic, a person needed a sacrifice, and an army of 20,000 monsters would require 20,000 victims. Capsidy noted that if Brazel used his prisoners, he would not be able to collect even 10,000, and so he asked himself where he got the rest of the victims. He suddenly noticed how Isu, Rito, and Rado were pushing another bag of demons into the portal and realized that they had resurrected 10,000 demons. Capsidy noted that these demons could be used in battle or as sacrifices and realized that not only had he lost half a day, but he had also shown that he had helped Brazel destroy his second home. Angrily shouting out the name Brazel, Capsidy wrote something on a piece of paper and, sealing it in an envelope, resolutely approached the portal. Ritter, Rado, and Esu asked if he was going to the battlefield. Handing them the envelope, Capsidy announced that he was leaving the rest to them, and one of the wards took the letter in his hands. Capsidy wanted to enter the portal, but they explained to him that it only works in one direction, so he would have to walk back. Capsidy, without answering anything, went out into the street and ran in the right direction. Looking after him, Rito, Rado, and Isu noted that he had left, and said that his durability and magical power were truly incredible, because after resurrecting 7,000 demons, he could still move. One of the wards remembered that they said that Capsodius was kicked out because he was considered the weakest, but admitted that he did not think that he was really the weakest of the four heavenly monarchs. 
Raising his hand with the letter up, one of the demons exclaimed that they could not fail Capsodius, and therefore invited the others to go. Currently, having rested and risen to his feet, Capsidy looked decisively at the demons. High Dragon, exclaiming joyfully, admitted that he did not expect to see a familiar face here, and asked if it could be that this was fate. Capsidy, without reacting to these words, looked at the unconscious adventurers lying on the ground, and Sharon, turning to Capsidy, advised him not to approach, because it was a monster, and even Capsidy would not be able to defeat it. High Dragon, lifting Sharon up, noted that this was a very annoying woman, and remembering that she called it a monster, admitted that what she said was quite interesting. Turning to Capsodius, it asked if they really called him Capua. Hydrogen asked if he really began to live in a human city in secret from everyone. It called Capsidy by his real name, but Capsidy just stood there silently, frowning at Hydragon. Laughing, Hydragon realized that he was right, and throwing the unconscious Sharon aside, admitted that he knew that Capsidy would hide in the village, but noted that he did not think that he would do this in a human village. It asked if Capsidy knew what he would be called after this. Capsidy did not answer and Hydragon angrily said that he would be called a traitor, and Capsidy, closing his eyes, admitted that all he wanted was to exist peacefully, no matter with demons or people. Hydragon noted that this all sounded cool, but exclaimed that it was impossible. This raised one hand upward, and a magic circle appeared in the sky, towards which the monsters engulfed in flames rose. It called Capsodius an idiot, and asked to look at this ten thousand army. Hydragon added that there were 5,000 more from the army that this brought, making a total of 15,000. It asked, does he still think he can win? Capsidy fearfully noted that it was 10,000 and put his hand forward, about to activate his magic, but Hydragon, noticing this, exclaimed that he knew that Capsidy's death-type magic was very strong. However, it added that it also heard that its instant kill skill that steals life uses up a lot of magic power, and asked if Capsidy really plans to use it on that much. Hydragon noted that even though Capsidy was a former celestial monarch, he looked rather tired and asked if Capsidy knew about this, and asked if he really wanted to defeat monsters with his demigod power. Hydragon noted that this is impossible, because these 15,000 fighters will simply kill Capsodius, and even if Hydragon dies, they will resurrect him. It promised that it would very quickly turn this city into dust, take advantage of the saint, kill all the people, and destroy the city in which Capsidy lives. Capsidy again put his hand forward and, activating his magic, formed a magic circle aimed at the entire army of demons and shouted so that they all just die. 